Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the today's good morning. We've got a chatty group this morning. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to today's special meeting, our second session of priority setting. May the would the clerk please take the roll. Jimenez. Torres. Present. Cohen. Here. Ortiz. Present. Davis. Here. Doan. Present. Candelas. Present. Foley. Here. Batra. Present. Kame. Present. Mahan. Here. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you to the members of the public who are here, all of our city staff. I know we're going to have a very robust discussion today. Appreciate you all being here. I want to just lay out a little bit of context, and then I'll turn it over to our city manager to do the same. Um, first, once again, as, as we head into the second session, I want to just thank everybody who participated in the transition committee process, which is what we focused on in the first session. Thanks to the leadership of our council members here, senior city staff, and over 100 community members, we were able to go very deep into our thinking in five focus areas. And I, I do think it's really important that we have focus areas because our community wants to see, desperately needs to see progress in some critical areas, speeding up permitting to build the housing we need, addressing homelessness, improving public safety, having a cleaner and safer city. So I think there's a uh, real need for us to focus in in a few areas and be clear that there are some places where we want to move the needle faster, where we believe we need transformation, and where we want to invest in experimentation and learning, learning faster, trying new things, taking some risks. So that's uh, at least why I see value in having focus areas. Today, while we discuss those focus areas, we're also going to have an opportunity to hear from staff about the breadth of work that the city does. And I think it's really important that while we say, hey, there are some things that we're going to prioritize moving faster on and where we're going for transformation, there's also a lot of other important work that our city does, and we don't want to lose sight of that. I think that came up in the first session. I think we had council members say, well, what about these other things that are important? And so for today, as we hear the staff report, you'll get a sense of the breadth of work that the city undertakes, and we'll have an opportunity to talk about all of those city service areas. So we're really doing two things today. We're, we're accepting, we're hearing and accepting the staff report, which will both give some early analysis of the sort of feasibility and relevance of the transition committee readout from last week, but also covering, getting, getting more insight into those city service areas. So we'll get the staff report. And then second will be feedback from my council colleagues. And on that piece, I, I just want to note that my team is here. We'll be taking copious notes. We really want to hear from all of the council members. Obviously, the Brown Act limits how much we can discuss outside of an open public meeting like this. So this is your opportunity to share feedback in advance of the March budget message. And it's important to me that that budget message isn't just my message, but that it reflects the collective wisdom and interest of the council and that I'm incorporating the best thinking of the council. So we'll be listening very intently during the feedback session later in the meeting and look forward to hearing from each council member what your priorities are, what you hope to see incorporated into that budget message so that as best as possible that message can incorporate the, the values and priorities and best thinking of the council. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Those are the two big things on the agenda. Staff report, which we'll take first. We'll go to public comment, and then we'll go to feedback from, uh, from the council. So I think with that, I'll hand it over to the city manager to share some additional context. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, good morning, everyone. I also want to extend my thanks to the mayoral transition committees and the over 120 members of the community, our city council members, and city staff who embraced a new approach to priority setting during this transition year. I know from my 32 years of experience with the city of San Jose that the next four months will be challenging. And I also know we will all come together as one team to create a budget 
that provides great services and programs to our community and addresses the wicked challenges we face as a big city. Ultimately, we will collectively do our best to meet the needs of our community through the adoption of a balanced budget in June. Now I'm going to take this opportunity as city manager to set some context for this special meeting. During the initial days of the transition, the mayor and council members asked me what I and my administration needed to be successful. I requested then, I will continue to request, focus. We need focus for three key reasons. First is our community. We have a community who depends on the delivery of 98 core services and 264 programs every day. And we also recognize there are acute issues impacting our community and organization that need specific focus and additional attention. Given the need to continually ensure effective and successful implementation of our core services and programs, our priorities must be limited in number and focused on only the highest of community needs. Second is our budget. While we have made significant progress, the city still has a general fund budget that is structurally out of balance and there is an unclear period of economic uncertainty ahead of us. Focus and prioritization becomes even more important after considering that the vast majority of the city's budget has restricted or specialized uses. Given the city's constrained gen general fund budgetary condition and historic budget challenges, there is always a limited availability of truly discretionary resources in the general fund. Third and finally is our staff capacity. Even when our vacancies are filled and the administration is fully staffed, we will still be the leanest large city in the United States. We can only truly move the needle on a limited number of acute community and organizational issues if we focus our staff capacity on the most important things. I understand that we will approach this upcoming budget process with very different backgrounds, perspectives, and values. Ultimately, we are one team of elected officials, professional and line staff, and members of our community, and I truly believe that our distinct values are a good thing. It is our diversity that makes us stronger as a community, as does our form of government, being a city that is closest to our residents, businesses, and visitors. Of course, we will all need to make certain compromises during the budget process. That is the nature of governing for the greater good with finite resources. But it is this collective diversity that helps ensure all aspects of our community needs have been considered when we formulate the budget, rooted in equity that by and large works for everyone. Again, the administration is looking to be more focused on our most wicked challenges as we head into next fiscal year so that we can be more successful and accountable in all that we do for our community. I'm proudly looking forward to working together with our new mayor and all of our returning and new city council members in doing just that. Again, thank you, Mayor and City Council, for the opportunity to provide some opening comments. I will now turn the presentation over to Assistant City Manager Lee Wilcox and my leadership team. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. If I can ask the team to put up the presentation, and while they're doing that, um, I am Lee Wilcox, the Assistant City Manager, and joining me today are all of our Deputy City Managers, Kip Harkness, Rosalind Huey, Angel Rios, Rob Lloyd, Angel Passons, and our Chief of Staff in the City Manager's Office, Dolan Beckel. Today, as directed by the Council, the presentation and Council discussion will do the following. It will promote a common understanding of the entire budget process, including priority setting and future milestones that the community and Council have to participate in the process. Confirm the continuing work of the existing 42 initiatives on the citywide roadmap that is council directed. Ensure a common understanding of the city's service delivery framework and the role and history of priority setting, the mayor's March budget message, the adopted budget within the city's service delivery framework. Understand the mayor's suggested focus areas and their relationship to the city service areas and the administration's directed urgent and important work within each of the CSAs that is currently going on and that will likely continue through next year's budget process. Provide an understanding and initial high level and ongoing staff analysis of the mayor's transition committee's recommendations in the role of the report um, within the framework of the budget process. And most importantly, as the mayor highlighted, provide feedback to the mayor on suggested focus areas prior to the release of the mayor's March budget message.
as we spoke about on February 14th, there's several opportunities um, in the budget process for council to deliberate, collaborate, and hear the community as they participate in the process. We're here today with the last uh, priority setting or, or annual goal setting process before the release of the mayor's March message, uh, which here is is uh, March 14th. Um, I will say there is a rules memorandum for tomorrow, changing this date to March uh, 21st, um, which the mayor's office has collaborated with um, with the administration on that proposal. Um, this is a clear another opportunity for the council to discuss, for the community to participate. After that process. Uh, staff goes to work, Jim Shannon and his team, as well as the rest of the senior leadership of the city, which is sitting behind me, uh, starts on putting together the proposed budget. Whatever comes out of the March message, as well as other urgent fiscal, uh, programmatic, and community needs is put together in the limitations of our capacity within that budget and presented back to the council and the community uh, through a number of community meetings and public hearings or what we would call budget study sessions for the council to dive in deeper around each of our city, city service areas, which I'll discuss later. The council then participates um, after budget study sessions with a host of questions and, and a lot of back and forth with city staff through managers' budget addendums, through meetings, emails, in, info memos, um, and proposes, proposes changes uh, to the proposed budget through budget documents that are submitted to the mayor. And then the mayor has the charter responsibility of closing the budget process through the June budget message. Um, again, additional opportunity for council and community participation in that process. Historically, and, and I would say best practices within local government, that priority setting, annual goal setting, or strategic planning is intended to help inform our mayor's March budget message. Um, that's what it's been intended uh, to do here for quite a while, as well as the formulation of just our annual budget. Um, this process does evolve every year in response to any unique situations that the council administration or community may be facing, but as Jennifer noted, it's important that we tackle these as one team. These changes can be expected or in unexpected situation driven by many factors and changes to the process. But most importantly, you know, what I wanted to do was clear up from the last meeting is sometimes we use priority setting, annual goal setting, and strategic planning uh, interchangeably. Uh, and I get that that is, is very confusing. So I wanted to, to back up um, just the term priority setting. It's, it's kind of evolved um, over the course of several years with the city and just for some of our returning council members who were not here um, and our new council members is just give a brief history of what priority setting was, what it was intended to do, and then how it evolved into to what we're doing now, which I think is really important. So in 2010, during the Great Recession, as we were facing cuts of, of over $100 million in cutting city services, um, importantly, the council continued to do policy work. During that period of time, then Rick Doyle, our city attorney, told the council, time out. We're passing these policies. I don't have the staff to actually write the ordinances in a timely fashion to accompany some of that work. We were so short on staff. So in the fall, we would go through a process for the, those, that first year and the second year of prioritizing ordinances after council would pass policies, which would be worked on first and brought forward. Obviously with the council really prioritizing those most urgent ordinances um, and policy work first. Over the course of time, priority setting um, evolved to include not just the ordinance work after policy work, but the policy work itself. A lot of important policies, um, you know, have, have been introduced and implemented and evolved through that period of time. As that process evolved and included more than just policy work, we started to get into strategies, we started to get into fiscal analysis of, of future programs. Starting in 2018, the administration changed the period of time of priority setting. It used to happen in the fall, totally outside of the budget process. We tried to have that happen a little bit uh, more in tail or aligned with the budget process starting in 2018, uh, really driving to what we did in 2020, which was do priority setting, or you could call it annual goal setting or strategic planning, uh, for the first time in 2020, we did that prior to the release of the Mayor's March budget message. Um, 
We took a little bit of a turn uh, two weeks after that with a shelter in place and global pandemic. So much of the work that that council uh, worked on as well as that March budget message was kind of thrown out the window as the organization was focused uh, or rotated to focus on the global pandemic and our own local needs that our community was facing. This process continued to evolve uh, during COVID uh, to operations. And we went with a roadmap approach to try and get a handle on the mayor and council's highest priorities, but then also the resources to do that work. Um, so now we're coming out of COVID-19. Um, oddly enough, today is the last day of the statewide emergency uh, for COVID-19. So we're coming out of this process and the mayor once again is taking the lead to outline a, a priority setting process or annual goal setting process prior to his own uh, March budget message. While we feel comfortable with where we've been, that we've innovated and tried to be nimble for mayor and councils, I think Jennifer's comments that we need to be focused to achieve what the community really needs is important. And so while we encourage experimentation and testing in any of these process, we do think given our current situation um, that is important that whether we call it priority setting or annual goal setting, um, or strategic planning that is really incorporated into the budget process. Any of these, whatever three we choose to call them, uh, lays out the direction and goals uh, for our organization and the guidelines to achieve those goals by various actions. But it's really the budget process that puts money and resources behind us accomplishing those goals for you um, as the mayor and council and the community. Moving on to our service delivery model. Uh, it does start our, uh, our city service delivery framework with mayor and council priorities. So it's very telling that we're beginning the budget process, having a conversation about what these priorities or focus areas are. As we move to the right, we start to get in what the mayor had just talked about, the breadth of the organization and what we do. The city's uh, service areas, or I will refer to them as CSAs, um, it integrates services provided in individual departments into the city's five key lines of business, community and economic development, environmental and utility services, neighborhood services, public safety, and transportation and aviation services. An additional CSA referred to as strategic support uh, represents our internal functions that enable us to achieve the outcomes of the other five CSAs to provide services to our community. These cross-departmental CSAs provide a forum for strategic planning, investment decisions within the context of the mayor and council priorities that are initially expressed in the mayor's March budget message and ultimately approved by the council. As Jennifer noted, it is important to note that most of the city's budgetary and staffing resources are dedicated to core services and programs that are provided on a routine uh, basis and public infrastructure rehabilitation projects that the community expects the city to perform on a day-to-day -day basis. While often considered business as usual, the implementation of these seemingly routine activities is the city's primary function and absorbs a bulk of the city's resources. With that said, in between the mayor and council priorities and our CSA structure and the day-to-day, functions, there are a number of urgent and important and continuing work streams that each of the CSA will continue to deliver unless otherwise directed by the council and does require a high degree of leadership and management capacity from senior staff to drive change within the organizational uh, framework. Some of this work is often very complex. This, works, uh, this work can be either council directed uh, by a number of the items on the citywide roadmap they can be beyond any existing CSA structure requiring you know, additional leadership capacity. They can be very urgent, time sensitive, or critical in a very short, short amount of time that we need to sprint. And last but not least, with uh, what we refer to in the public policy world, it could be a wicked problem, which on our roadmap right now exists several wicked problems. And these are described by uh, a set of problems where the solutions off uh, solutions uh, and resources often lie outside of our own boundaries of authority, uh, geography. They're often symptoms of another problem or many problems in society. 
There's often no proven solution, but when a solution or a semi-solution is developed, it does require massive changes to systems and bureaucracies throughout many organizations, as well as the private sector in a number of cases. Those ur urgent and important initiatives that I've just outlined occur for several reasons, including uh, shifting community needs, societal changes, economic changes, federal and state mandates, as well as fragmented policy, policy making at a federal and state level, void of any direct or indirect analysis or resources given to counties or cities to mitigate or manage those impacts. A great example of this, while too simplistic, is what we deal with with our unhoused crisis for our residents sleeping on our street. While the federal government can look at criminal justice reform and our state government gets to celebrate behavioral health reform, the analysis and further streams down the, line, uh, down the line to really think about what these individuals may need in the way of services or what services and resources do our local governments need to actually mitigate these challenges is often not done in those arenas, leaving these decisions to us. So this is often what makes up these type of problems. A majority of the mayor and council priorities is you are all confronted with uh, numerous uh, cries for help from community members to solve these challenging things. And we'll go into um, what some of those are currently on our own work plans in the next few slides. I do wanna start with a deeper dive into our city service area and our core service map. Our plans, policies, and investment decisions at a CSA level are carried out through these operations. In our last year's budget or our current budget, the city has 90 or 98 core services and 264 programs that we provide to our residents. These align with our budget so that uh, anyone can see what a core service or what a program uh, is resourced at, including our staff, dollar amounts, as well as our performance. And just to do an example of this, I'll, I'll use three quick examples. So our first, if you look at environmental and utility services, on the very top we have, or I'm sorry, not on the very top, in the very middle um, under that, there is an, an uh, bolded environmental services. So that is one of our core services there which I'll highlight in a second. Under strategic support, um, on the left-hand box, we have a category under finance called debt and treasury management. And then last but not least, which I'll highlight in a second, is under neighborhood services, under uh, parks and recreation and neighborhood services, we have an item called community services. So if I go to the first for environmental services, our environmental services department, you can go down about half of the way and see environmental services as our, one of our core city services. However, there's six programs that fold up into that, being potable water, recycled water, recycling and garbage, stormwater management, sustainability, environmental health, as well as wastewater management. As we go forward again, for strategic support under finance, I mentioned before, um, where is, oh, on the top, the debt and treasury management. We have our banking management under this that finance manages, our cashiering and payment processes, our debt management, as well as investment management that folds up into these. And last but not least, as part of the neighborhood services, CSA and part of our parks, recreation and neighborhood services program for community services, which is a core um, service, we have programs such as anti-graffiti and litter, illegal dumping and homelessness encampment management, collection and abatement services, and then youth and gang prevention uh, programs all fold up into those city service areas. And then last but not least, the Department of Transportation uh, with a host of supporting uh, CSA core services and programs that roll up into those. So these 98 core services and 264 programs are carried out by 6,884 full-time employees for the city. As Jennifer mentioned, while we do have vacancies, even if fully staffed, we would remain a thinly staffed city hall to accomplish these goals. Given that, the need to ensure effective implementation of core services and programs 
and, and I should just state, these core services and programs, they evolve. Obviously, we live uh, in a society that continues to evolve, a community that continues to evolve in the way of needs. We're constantly looking, um, our staff is constantly looking at how we're more efficient, more equitable, um, how these core services are meeting the needs um, of various communities uh, within our borders. But again, any new priorities do need to be limited in number and focused on the highest and most important community needs if the council wishes to make progress towards those goals. This prioritization becomes even more important after considering that the vast majority of the city's budget, as Jennifer mentioned, is restricted and or is, has specialized uses. Our budget for this past year was a little over six uh, billion dollars. Even when you look into the general fund though, uh, not all of the general fund is truly discretionary. As you can see, a great uh, deal of that goes to other uses, uh, revenue offsets of expenditures, or our retirement contributions for our unfunded actual liability, or OPEB, which uh, retiree health care. So given the city's constraints in our general fund budget condition and historical budget challenges, there's usually a limited availability of true discretionary resources in the general fund. So without a significant increase in revenues, difficult choices, around offsets or eliminating programs to achieve other new goals, our hands are tied often. And Lee, sorry to interject, that was not 59% of six billion. Can you just No, I'm sorry. That? Yeah, that is absolutely correct. So let me go back. So six billion dollars is, uh, a little over six billion dollars is our total budget. This represents just our general fund, which I'm going to get the number wrong, but it is a little over a billion dollars, I think currently, Jennifer. I think it's 1.4. 1.4. Right, so is that right? 400 million, at, I guess, is a little. I'm looking, I'm getting a thumbs up from uh, yeah. Jim Shannon. Okay. So, still, still yes, the 59% is of the <laughs> 1.4 billion. Thank you for that clarification. I'm sorry. So as we move forward, if we really look and try and illustrate, given the recommendations that the mayor's put forward or what any other recommendations that will come out of the mayor's March budget message in the way of uh, mayor and council priorities is really to, to put it in uh, our service delivery framework. So we've just mentioned kind of on the bottom some of our core services and programs. And then we're gonna be hearing a report from Dolan around uh, the direction we were given around commenting around the outcomes and recommendations around the five focus areas. In addition to these five focus areas, as I mentioned before, there's other urgent and important work that occurs in between our normal lines of business and what the mayor and council's priorities may or may not be in any given year. So I, we, all of us here today, are going to walk through our individual CSAs and talk about what some of that important and urgent work that is occurring now and likely to incur well in uh, past June 30th, given the complexity of that work. And so I will start with handing it over to Angel Rios for our Neighborhood Services CSA. All right, thank you, Lee. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the Neighborhood Services and Education Community Services CSA is driven by the belief that the diverse mosaic of people who live work, learn, and play in San Jose deserve clean, vibrant, accessible, and inclusive public spaces that inspire friendship and connection across generations, cultures, and points of view. Our neighborhoods and public life must reflect the rich cultural history and lived experiences of our residents. Neighborhoods should serve as conduits for people to connect with one another, to build community, and provide pathways to opportunity, lifelong learning, and prosperity. With this in mind, and in addition to the mayor's suggested clean neighborhoods focus area, I'd like to highlight five uh, important work areas that our CSA is focused on. The first is animal care and services. We are currently re-engineering our service delivery approach to better address the increase in pets at our shelter, the shortage of medical personnel, and to, quite frankly, better engage and coordinate with community partners. In the area of children and youth, um, we are leading a citywide effort aimed at creating and expanding opportunity pathways and supports from cradle to career for all San Jose children and youth with a special emphasis placed on high need neighborhoods. 
uh, in the area of, of education, digital literacy, digital equity, and broadband, um, we're implementing multiple efforts aimed at bridging the digital divide through promoting connectivity, device access, and digital literacy to all residents of San Jose. With an emphasis on senior residents, adults with low digital literacy skills, and, and families with school-aged children. Uh, in the area of park maintenance and capital improvements, uh, we have a focus on implementing PRNS's Activate SJ plan that emphasizes enhancing neighborhood and regional parks and diminishing our deferred maintenance backlog. And lastly, in the area of senior and therapeutic services, and similar to our focus on children and youth, our work in this area aims to enrich and expand lifelong learning opportunities, learning, recreational, and enrichment programs for seniors and people with disabilities. That's a kind of a high-level uh, snapshot of the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to public safety. Thank you, Angel. I have public safety. So under public safety, we have several uh, large work streams right now of the five that I wanted to highlight. The first is our continuity of operations plan. Uh, this is uh, needed for us to maintain critical services during an emergency. COOP plans four and lays out all of the services, essential services and resources to deliver those core services and helps prioritize those um, and lay those out in a fashion that we're able to deliver what is critically needed given the emergency. Second, uh, and on the same lines of emergency management, continuing with our disaster resiliency work with a real specific focus around continued and increased and enhanced trainings for not only our staff, which continues to go through mandatory trainings and certification, to work in the Emergency Operations Center, but most importantly, our community. Um, and this occurs in several languages um, so that our community can help care for themselves and others when the emergency happens. Third is police redistrict redistricting, and this is a, a project to help uh, ma maximize efficiencies and better balance calls for services across the 16 patrol districts in the city, thereby reducing uh, response times. Fourth is our police reforms work plan, uh, which is quite large. This is a culmination of various audit recommendations and recommendations from two different after action reports, 21st Century Policing Report, Reimagining Community Safety Report and Recommendations, as well as various audits and our um, OIA report, totaling over 500 recommendations. Uh, in total, 226 have been completed and implemented while we're still working on over 100 and prioritizing the rest with the community in the next several weeks, reporting out to the PIS -PIS community and uh, committee in May. And last but not least, lessons learned from the SCU and CZU fires uh, uh, that, that occurred in 2020 and further uh, working on wildlife protection plans for some of our foothills uh, along the east side and in South San Jose, as well as working with all departments on evacuation planning uh, and having those plans ready if they were to occur. I hand it over to Rosalind Huey. Great, thank you, Lee. Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. So our work in the Community and Economic Development CSA is focused toward a strong economy for everyone here in our city, uh, including all of our residents, our small businesses, our arts and nonprofit community, and of course, our large companies. And so with that, I just wanna highlight five of the very important work items that our CSA is currently focused on. Uh, first, the Berryessa flea market vendors. We are continuing to engage with the flea market vendors. We are currently working with them in establishing the advisory committee, uh, which will happen this spring. Uh, and we will continue to support and provide services to the vendors during the transition of the flea market site. For COVID-19 recovery, uh, our team is focused on implementing the 10 prioritized recommendations from the task force report, which the city council accepted in December. And these recommendations are equity centered, really focused on those in our community who were most impacted by the pandemic. We will continue to focus on development in the Deridon area, including Google's Downtown West project. Uh, and we are glad that Google remains committed to the project for the long term and currently is undergoing demolition on a portion of the site. 
The CSA continues its focus on housing production, particularly affordable housing, uh, and we will continue to implement many of the items in our housing catalyst work plan. Uh, one of the important items in that work plan is the housing element, uh, which is out for drafts. We've gotten initial comments back from the State Department of Housing and Community Development, and we are on track to bring our housing element to the City Council for approval in June of this year. Uh, and then staff is also continued to focus on two priority items um, identified by the City Council. We will be bringing the wage, wage theft ordinance to Council actually next month, uh, and then we will immediately start work on the responsible contract, contractor ordinance. And with that, now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kip Harkness. Thank you, Rosalind. Good morning. I'm Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager over Infrastructure and Emergency Management. The Environment and Utility City Service Area comprises the utility services of water, potable and recycled, sanitary sewer, wastewater treatment, stormwater, garbage, recycling, and clean electricity, as well as related environmental protection programs and climate change mitigation. These utilities are perhaps the most core service in any city. When they are well managed, the provision of these necessities of life is mostly invisible to the residents and businesses sometimes literally so, as they run through pipes and conduits hidden underground. To ensure continued world-class provision and required expansion of these utilities on which San Jose depends, the City Service Area has identified the following top five most important work efforts. One, clean energy scaling. Scaling the provision of clean electrical energy in San Jose and therefore scaling the team that delivers this service is the Condiciones San Juan the indispensable action which must be done to meet our ambitious 2030 carbon reduction goals and address climate mitigation. Two, municipal regional permits, stormwater. The new requirements and provisions of the most recent permit place a deluge of expectations on the city and property owners that we are neither funded, staffed, nor organized to fully meet. Figuring out a way of funding and scaling this work will be required to comply with federal law, in this case, the Clean Water Act. Three, sanitary and storm sewer collection slash green storm water infrastructure. In this area, we must complete our master planning work and continue the shift from ad hoc management of these important systems by three departments to a clearer and more efficient utility model of governance. Four, staffing transitions, environmental services and public works. Utility service operators and infrastructure builders globally are seeing a mass retirement of talent and face difficulty recruiting and training replacements, as well as retraining existing staff to make better use of technology and deal with the effects of climate change. Environmental services and public works in San Jose are no exception to this and must focus over the coming year on building the bench to ensure the continued high quality operation of systems and to lead needed change. Five, water supply negotiations. Environmental Services is leading three complex interrelated negotiations to expand water supply and lock in certainty on supply. Reliable water supply in a warmer and drier California will be required to continue to build the housing of all types that our residents need. These day-to-day -day efforts are on top of these important efforts are on top of the day-to-day -day work of managing and delivering the 11 core services and 31 programs in this city service area, as well as the launching of new initiatives as directed by council and numerous service improvements that do not rise to the top five. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Rob Lloyd and Transportation and Aviation. Thank you, Kip. On the middle far right, the Transportation and Aviation City Service Area provides our community with safe, secure, and efficient transportation that supports San Jose's livability and economic vitality. Specific to the CSA's urgent and important and continuing work, uh, there is a combination of major projects and ongoing operational investments the responsible departments manage. This includes what you see in terms of maintaining and uh, the community forest, uh, as well as city streets, construction of the new airport terminal, a, a private-public partnership pursuit of the airport connector to Deridon, regional work on the BART Silicon Valley extension, the effort to reimagine how we handle vehicle blight, and more. The majority of the budgets of the Department of Transportation and the airport are tied to maintenance and operations of infrastructure. Uh, as Lee uh, referred and indicated, about 55% of the transportation budget is assigned for maintenance and street pavement, sanitary sewers, storm sewers, street landscape, and transportation infrastructure. 
Sixty percent of the airport budget is in their maintenance and operation fund. The 2023 through 2027 capital improvements plan for the CSA is over a billion dollars, but focused primarily on improving streets condition and the new terminal and related buildings. An interesting note, the general fund portion of the budgets um, of these departments are 34 percent for transportation and zero percent respect, uh, for airport respectively, reflecting the city's use of federal and state funds as well as revenue generation at the airport. The impact of the urgent, important, and continuing work shows San Jose's streets and pavement condition index has risen to 71, qualifying San Jose's streets as good for the first time in many years and making substantial progress on the community forest management plan and has key transportation safety projects in flight. Mineta International, uh, San Jose Mineta International Airport has high passenger ratings at 88%, is tracking towards COVID recovery passenger numbers at 12 million, won the 2022 Airport Efficiency Excellence Awards and Silicon Valley style, was recognized as having the fastest Wi-Fi at any airport. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Dolan. Actually, oh, sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and do strategic support for the council. So as I mentioned, strategic support is foundational and, and helps implement all of the other good work that you just heard. There's currently five uh, major priorities that our city manager has identified and that staff is working on. Uh, our first is closing racial inequities in the city. So this work includes the staff's continued training and expertise around policy development, a resource, uh, a resource analysis, um, and, and decision making around resource distribution. Second, delivering ex ex excellent customer service. Uh, our customer service initiative and findings of the initial phase will be coming to council in the next few weeks, but this is a large initiative across the entire organization to help serve our community and our residents uh, more efficiently and better. Driving organizational performance is our continued um, efforts around uh, performance data and us having access to data to really grade ourselves to make policy changes, resource changes, and folding that into the budget. And that'll be a major effort over the next year. Making San Jose a great place to work. That is a lot of uh, bulk of that work is what um, most of the Public Safety uh, Finance Strategic Support Committee heard uh, last week or the week before around our recruitment efforts, around our vacancies, but also around our retention efforts with our existing employees, our trauma-informed care work with our organization, and many important initiatives that focus on the people uh, that do the great work that you're uh, seeing today. And last but not least, structurally balancing the general fund budget. Um, and that is gonna be very important um, and difficult for the organization as we step out of COVID recovery. While COVID has been extremely difficult, the city's response on the city workforce, we've had hundreds of million dollars from the federal and state government um, to go ahead and uh, fund that response and those um, services for our community. So um, as of today, we have a little over $90 million uh, federal and state money that we're continuing to spend. Um, and those services are on services that are in more ways than not ongoing services. So that creates additional delta for us and, the, and for you all if those services are to continue for the community uh, during the recovery phase. And so with that, I will hand uh, the rest of the presentation over to Dolan Beckel. Great, thank you, Lee. Uh, two weeks ago today, exactly at this time, the Mayoral Transition Committee provided their report on actionable and measurable recommendations to inform the Mayor's March budget message. During our staff analysis of the Transition Committee report, we asked six key questions you can see on the slide to gain initial insights. For the recommendations, we asked, are these recommendations feasible and could they be implemented if adequately resourced? Second question we asked, does staff recommend alternatives that could drive the outcome in the same direction with similar scale? For the success metrics, we asked one, do we collect the data today to allow us to report on our performance? Oops, sorry. Number two, uh, what degree of influence does the city actually have in moving the needle? Number three, are we able to disaggregate the metrics by race and or location? And number four, what frequency do we collect the data to understand if we're able to make timely decisions based on recent trends and patterns in the data? 
And as you can see, my experiment with PowerPoint animation failed miserably, so just ignore what's on the screen. Uh, so the good news is that for the recommendations, 100% of the recommendations are feasible, and for 23% of the recommendations, staff also provided an alternative for consideration as well, not in place of, but in addition to. For the success metrics, I'm just going to summarize by saying there's a moderate gap between what the committee desired for performance reporting and what our current capability is. The summary is here on the screen, but more importantly, there's an attachment C to the council memo that will explain all of our analysis on the success metrics, uh, where we stand on collection, influence, disaggregation, and frequency. If city council approval of the mayor's March budget, budget message provides direction to include the transition committee's recommendations, the performance reporting, and closure of this performance reporting gap, the administration will conduct further analysis on the costs, incorporate them into the city manager's proposed budget as appropriate starting on April 26. Upcoming um, and on completion of today's section, session, the next milestone uh, upon completion of today is the mayor's March budget message and council hearing, which is currently scheduled for March 14th, um, but pending the change that rules today, we'll move to March 21st. So that concludes our presentation and report, and we and senior staff in the audience are stand ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Really helpful overview. Just before we go to public comment, can we put slide 12 back up? Just wanted to make a quick point on slide 12, and then we'll... We'll move to public comment. Sorry, I should have noted earlier. Oh, maybe not. You know, why don't we go to public comment, and I will make my point when we begin discussion. So we'll go, we'll go to public comment, and I think we'll probably start with folks in the room. Yep, we'll start with people in person. So I'm going Great. to call your name if you can just come down and get in a line here at the bottom. Um, you can speak in any order that you'd like. Um, I have Jeffrey, Jennifer, Sandra. When you come to the mic, please just state your name. Thank you. Working Partnerships USA. I uh, would like to encourage the council to support the uh, 227 memo from Councilmember Ortiz. Uh, appreciate all the work that staff has done on the staff memo and a number of the ideas to emerge from uh, the transition committees. Certainly we agree we need to focus, um, but uh, we remain, remain concerned that what is being pitched by the mayor as a back to basics budget uh, could quickly devolve into a backroom budget without proper oversight of the members of this council. Um, this has been the most opaque priority setting process that we've seen in years. Uh, and while yes, we agree we need priorities, we need to ask ourselves uh, priorities for who and, and by who. Uh, I think it was disturbing to see uh, in two weeks ago in the staff box uh, who was really given the reins of the community chairs of this process to see out-of-town corporate developers be given such a say uh, and the community to be largely locked out of a process of developing these ideas is concerning. Uh, we can't, as a city hall, take a step backwards uh, towards uh, corporate developers, real estate interests, and campaign donors being who writes the rules. Uh, you as council members have the opportunity to shape what our priorities are. Uh, we, we trust that you will do a good job in this process. Uh, and we know that you have the best interests of your neighborhoods in mind, and we really just encourage council to consider uh, extending priorities beyond the five that were ID'd uh, by the mayor and his supporters. Uh, certainly, the three ideas put forward in Councilmember Ortiz's memo are very important, the most important of which, uh, citywide hiring. I think uh, we can all agree that any priorities that we want to deliver as a city uh, the essential services that our neighbors deserve. Uh, we can't do it if we're making our staff work with one hand tied behind their back. 
we need to do more to fill those thousand vacancies to accomplish any of our goals. Thank you so much. Thank you, next speaker. Also, um, can Kira and Poncho um, come down? Uh, good almost afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cortez, and I am here with Working Partnerships USA and as a San Jose native, born and raised, to ask you to support a city budget that prioritizes the needs of all of San Jose residents, specifically the prevention of wage theft and the enforcement of a responsible construction ordinance. That is why I am supporting recommendation number two in the Ortiz memo. One thing that makes our city so special is our incredible diversity of people and professions. Unfortunately, of these many diverse families, tens of thousands of workers have their wages stolen from them in San Jose. And I have to wait, and have to wait months to hear back from the city's Office of Equality Assurance to hopefully and eventually get paid what they're owed. In California alone, more, oh, Sorry, last year, more than 19,000 workers filed claims with the state alleging wage theft, totaling more than $338 million. Enough is enough. We must take bold steps to protect workers from exploitation and wage theft and strongly incentivize new developers to work with contractors who treat workers with dignity and pay a fair return on their work. My job allows me the opportunity to conversate with workers of all walks of life here in the city of San Jose and it saddens me to know how many people have been and continue to be victims of wage theft. We need a budget that is grounded in economic justice and puts into place policies that support this agenda. A city that fails its workers in the most basic of ways, allowing employers to get away with stealing from their employees, is not one who prioritizes the needs of its workers. A city that has people working, being paid below the minimum wage, is not one who prioritizes the livelihoods of its workers. We cannot keep allowing this to happen, let alone support those with a history of being corrupt. Council member Ortiz's memo outlines the need for funding services and policy that protects workers. I hope you will consider his memo while making your decision about the city budget. I thank the council and mayor for your time and thoughtfulness in this process. It's time for a more equitable and resilient San Jose, one that funds the things we all need not only to survive, but to thrive. Thank you. I will be helping Sandra translate her statement. Buenas tardes, alcalde y ayuntamiento. Mi nombre es Sandra Muñoz. Soy residente de San Jose por más de 23 años. Para Working Partnership USA estoy trabajando y, est y estoy aquí para pedirle que apoye un presupuesto de la ciudad que favorezca las necesidades de todos los residentes de San Jose. Actualmente en San José es más fácil para un empleador salirse con la suya robando salarios a los trabajadores que incluso una de esas personas reciban apoyo para recibir el pago de lo que se les debe. Los administradores de nuestra ciudad deben ser responsables ante las personas, no con los desarrolladores y contratistas ricos que no están dispuestos a pagar su parte justa como ciudad. Damos a los desarrolladores millones de, de dólares en subsidios públicos al año y sin embargo, algunos de estos mismos desarrolladores continúan contratando contratistas y subcontratistas con un historial de engaño y abuso de los trabajadores. Mi trabajo me permite hablar con personas que se sienten que no tienen a nadie que les ayude contra empleadores que vulneran sus derechos y roban sus salarios cuando se permiten estos abusos afectan al trabajador y a sus familias y es increíble que en el año 2023 sigamos viviendo esto por lo tanto necesitamos una ordenanza que de construcción responsable que in incentiva fuertemente a los nuevos desarrolladores a trabajar con contratistas que traten a los trabajadores con dignidad y paguen con re rendimiento justo de su trabajo agradezco al consejo y al alcalde por su tiempo y consideración en este proceso y le imploro que le den más prioridad a una city budget para todos. All right. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Sandra, and I have been a resident of San Jose for over 23 years. I work for Working Partnerships USA, and I am here to ask you to support a city budget that prioritizes the needs of all San Jose residents. In San Jose today, it's easier for an employer to get away with stealing wages from workers than for even one of those people to be supported in getting paid what they're owed. 
Our city leaders must be supportive of their people, not wealthy developers and contractors unwilling to pay their fair share. As a city, we give developers millions of dollars in public subsidies a year, and yet some of these same developers continue to hire contractors and subcontractors with the history of misleading and abusing workers. My work allows me to speak with people who feel helpless against employers who violate their rights and steal their wages. When these abuses are allowed, they affect the worker and their families. It is appalling that in the year 2023, we continue to live this. Therefore, we need a responsible building ordinance that would strongly incentivize new developers to work with contractors who treat workers with dignity and pay a fair return for their labor. Thank you, Council and Mayor, for your time and consideration in this process. And I implore you to prioritize a city budget for all. Thank you. Um, before you speak, I'd also like to call down Kylie and Hector. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Kira Kazanzas, CEO of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Good afternoon. I'm also privileged to be the co-convener of the Real Coalition, and I'm a proud D3 resident. Um, as described in the staff memo, there are current incredibly important priorities, most of which also overlap with the priorities described in the Transition Committee reports. It's really important that we keep our eye on the ball. Continue to invest in racial justice and equity work. Continue investing in equitable recovery. Continue investing in reimagining public safety, particularly in police reforms and community-based solutions to violence. For example, investing in a RIPS pilot, such as the interpersonal violence response pilot proposed by Nextdoor Solutions, would be a smart and effective way to use a small part of the surplus. Continue investing in democracy. As we excuse me, demonstrated in the recovery task force process, community can work hand in hand with the city to generate great ideas and prioritize. Continue invested in permanent supportive housing solutions for our community and not just band-aids. In addition to some of the priorities and metrics found in the transition committees, we ask that council recommend these priorities as well as the priorities that we see in council member Ortiz's memo to the ongoing budget process which I know is a weird way of, a weird ask, but I don't know what else to ask for because it's kind of unclear how, where we stand in the process currently. So we're hoping to see these priorities and these specific asks be considered throughout the budget process. Thank you for your consideration. Good day. Uh, my name is Poncho Guevara. I'm the Executive Director of Sacred Heart Community Service. It's a pleasure seeing a new council and being able to speak to, uh, to you in person. Um, I just wanted to, I, I'm a, a District a 6 resident and um, uh, Executive Director of Sacred Heart, but also co-convener of the Real Coalition as well with Kira. And I just want to say uh, five quick points. One of them is the staff report is a really good start, including a focus on public safety reforms and the investment of racial justice infrastructure. Continue to invest in that and actually have that analysis provides a foundation to actually really rethink how we're doing things and how people are who are disproportionately affected by systems are at the center of these processes. Um, second, setting aside certain challenges of the mayor's transition process um, that did not exactly center voices of those disproportionately impacted by public systems, there were a number of really good ideas that came out of it, and including the focus on, on Vision Zero and some other reforms, and I want to thank the mayor for inviting people in. But I just want to remind the council that we've had a great track record, especially the last couple of years, of doing things a little bit differently having a process like the recovery task force that again center the voices of community in a different way the work that happened through reimagining public safety process that again center the voices of community in a different way there weren't just a few handful of meetings there were hundreds of hours of meetings and research to develop uh, ideas and responses based on work that's happened around the country coming from the real experience of people and that needs to get uh, be reminded I implore you to remember those ideas and to be able to help center some of these things moving forward, including like what Kira just, re uh, just uh, reminded us of a, a pilot proposal that could be around alternative responses to domestic violence intervention. Um, and also looking at things around homelessness prevention and the work that needs to happen there. And let's not forget some of the good work that's happened over the last couple of years, including Measure E, which made commitments to invest in affordable housing, uh, investments in homelessness prevention, and other resources. Um, thank you.
Hello, Council and Mayor. My name is Kylie Clark, and I'm the Manager of Advocacy and Public Policy at West Valley Community Services. I'm also a member of the nonprofit Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition. I'm hoping that you were able to review the letter that we sent you all yesterday, um, but as it states, we're asking for additional priorities to be added into the budget process. Um, we are, I'm personally concerned about the lack of engagement and transparency to the broader community during this process. The Real Coalition is made up of dozens of nonprofits which serve community members throughout the entire city. Our asks represent the asks and concerns of tens and thousands of people that you all serve. So my ask to you is that you take these seriously and that you understand that these needs that we are bringing up are the needs of the individuals that you all were elected to represent. This is especially important because the broader public just hasn't really been invited to engage in this process thus far, but our hope is that we're able to bring some of this to you and that you'll be able to include this in the budget process and in the priorities. We ask that you prioritize racial equity and furthering the work of the ORE. Prioritize equity and recovery by funding key findings of the recovery task force. Continue expanding the city's civic engagement capacity, further public safety reform by funding achievable priorities from the RIPS report, move forward with a specific RIPS recommendation, so for example, the implementation of a community-based interpersonal violence prevention and response pilot, something that tangibly you can add into the budget today in response to what the community has been asking for. And we also support the memorandum from Council Member Ortiz in the ongoing priorities that were described in the administration's memorandum. So thank you for all you do, thank you for your consideration, and thank you for working to include the community in this process. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Hector Sanchez Flores. I serve as the executive director of the National Compadres Network. I'm also part of the National Field Leaders Group for Boys and Men of Color, and more importantly, here in San Jose, I'm a resident of District 6 and also part of uh, the organization and a member of the Rio Coalition. I want to state that, you know, when we're in meetings, we're oftentimes reflecting on how we could be partners with the city, city council, the city, and the mayor. And one of the things that has come up is that in these moments of transition, things happen that are not completely transparent to us, though they may be very transparent to the leaders. And one of the things that we're seeking for is a letter, a, more, a sense of a deeper commitment of transparency and engagement with those of us that are working on a national and more importantly here on a local level. I want to say that um, that's the way community reflects on whether or not the leadership is engaged and, and listening to the community voice and giving that community voice legs in terms of the policy discussions that are being held. I really would like to see that we continue to center racial equity and specifically the way that we recover in an equitable manner so all residents can benefit in the recovery. That we look at alternatives to policing that don't center the carceral solutions alone that we have a deep commitment to continuing the engagement with the community so that those of us that are engaged both directly with you and hopefully with the community can be speaking from the same hymnal and singing from the same hymnal. Finally, the proposal to really examine the way interpersonal violence is addressed and the way that solutions uh, can be crafted, we're at a very critical moment. And I think it's important for the council and the mayor to view these proposals for these pilot programs, not just simply as innovations of how it is that we save resources, but how is it that we create a pathway to healing for the families that are most affected by this to give them the power to create visions for what they wish for themselves, their families, and the community that they're part of. Muchas gracias. Catherine Hedges. Um, good morning. My name is Catherine Hedges. I'm a downtown resident in District 3. I'm a member of uh, Surge and Shack, and I just want to second everything that the previous speakers have been saying about the process and about centering the people most affected and not having this, you know, top-down process by a select group of delegates we need to involve the community. And 
sorry, I was caught by surprise. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that some of the recommendations from reps made it into the budget recommendations. And I'm glad that some of the anti-displacement measures and and our homelessness. And I also second what people are saying from working partnerships about protecting employees from wage theft instead of catering to the out of town developers. Uh, thank you very much. Fred followed by M Gabby Mendoza. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you. I'll be brief. I support the move toward greater focus and prioritization within our city government. Uh, we cannot continue to try to be all things to all people and fund too many programs and initiatives. Uh, the city of San Jose is currently over $2 billion in debt. I ask that our city leaders focus on the key issues, primarily consisting of public safety and policing, homelessness and blight, which are the issues the voters of San Jose most want wanted addressed thank you gabby followed by krista hello uh, good afternoon mayor and city council my name is misrain mendoza i'm a resident of san jose and a resident of district seven for the past 25 years of my life i'm here with the organization of amigos de guadalupe a center for justice and empowerment I'm here to support a San Jose budget for all, especially to make sure young and family services are explicitly named and focus areas in the budget process. Uh, the city of San Jose is dear to my heart. This is my home. And I see every single day families walking into our doors that they need these services. Uh, please try to make it. Unfortunately, our most vulnerable parents and kids are not sufficiently served by the city. Uh, due to lack of uh, determinating programs and resources. We must better found programs to enrich the next generation of San Jose residents and renew a city's commitment to caring for kids and young from working families. Um, I thank the city council and the mayor for your time and thoughtfulness in this process, especially council member Ortiz who uh, whose memo highlights why we need to prioritize our kids and young. It is time for more equitable and resilient San Jose, one in which the well-being of our young people is front and center in our budget and found the things we all need to not only survive but to thrive. Please support a San Jose budget for all the center's young and family services as a key focus areas. Thank you for your attention. Krista, followed by Sandra. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Krista Delatori, and I am a union representative with IFPTE Local 21. We represent over 11,000 public sector workers throughout the Bay Area, including here in San Jose. I'm here today to ask you to support a city budget that prioritizes the needs of all San Jose residents. Right now, we are in a dire staffing crisis with over 900 unfilled vacancies. This affects every service we provide, including our very basic ones, many of which are critical to safety and quality of life from wastewater treatment and emergency response times. As you think through your upcoming budget priorities, it is imperative that staffing be your number one consideration. In the past few weeks, we've heard about a range of priorities we wanna work on as a city from housing to infrastructure to public safety and parks. Um, these are critical issues and having qualified and dedicated city employees is absolutely necessary to our progress on them. To not address our staffing crisis is to simply fail our residents here in San Jose. We urge you today to consider council member Ortiz's memo that prioritizes filling our 900 city vacancies and ensuring pay equity for our city workers, the very people who make our city work. Thank you. Sandra, followed by Deborah. Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Sandra Asher. I'm a 20 year resident of District 10. I'm a member of the city's reimagining public safety committee advocating for the disability community, a member of Surge Sacred Heart and co-founder of Safety for All. 
Almost a year ago, the City Council received the recommendations from the years long community reimagining public safety process that centered people with lived experience. As mentioned in the city staff presentation earlier, this is part of the city's urgent, important and continuing work. Today, I hope you will prioritize the public safety recommendations from the RIPS committee, specifically reducing interactions with the police and making our streets safer by expediting and fully funding Vision Zero, strengthening support for alternative crisis responses and treatment for those with substance use and mental illness through funding an additional trust team for San Jose, other alternative responses such as outlined in Council Member Ortiz's memo and investment in racial justice infrastructure. Given the recent F grade by the, to the City Council for its failure to implement meaningful public safety reform, the RIPS report gives you the guideline and a clear path towards making our city safer for all. Thank you. Deborah, followed by Lori. Hi, my name is Deborah St. Julian. I've lived in South San Jose for 38 years, recently redistricted to District 2. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and a faith community member. I'm heartened to hear all the speakers raising up the issue of racial equity. I support the reimagining public safety recommendation to reduce unnecessary interactions with the police. My question has become, will the presence of guns help or hurt this situation? We know there are other ways to address public safety as recommended in the RIPS report, like tra traffic safety report reform and the support of the trust response and other alternative response programs. The RIPS process was transparent and community led and should be central to the council's priority setting process. We need to not only support status quo police reform, we need to develop true non law enforcement community alternatives to public safety. When my neighbor who has impulse control and mental health issues has problems, I do not want to call someone with a gun. I want to be able to call professionally trained specialists to help de escalate the situation. I want to get help without endangering his life. Recently, the Council received an F grade for its efforts to implement meaningful public safety reform, meaning real alternatives, not just kind of the check the box reforms. The RIPS report gives you and all of us the relief of a clear map towards meaningful non carceral reform, as well as police reform. And I, I just um, really hope you follow that report. Thanks. Lori, followed by Dilza. Hi, good afternoon, council members. My name is Lori Catcher. I'm a 20 year resident and voter in District 6. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. And I'm speaking also in support of recommendations from the year long community reimagining public safety process that centered people with lived experience. Um, I'm a mother of three young adults, and I've also been a volunteer through the pandemic with our unhoused residents in Columbus Park. And through my experiences, I have learned that public safety overwhelmingly does not come by policing. Public safety results from caring for people. It comes from direct trauma informed and compassionate mental health care. Um, substance use um, programs, permanent supportive housing and resources for the most marginalized of our neighbors in our city. It comes from alternative crisis responses that don't involve law enforcement so that as community members, we can call for help and we know that the person who um, needs help will get the care that they deserve and the human dignity that they already possess. Um, so I'm asking that you support the reimagining public safety recommendations um, designed to reduce interactions with police, such as the ones I've mentioned and including traffic, traffic safety redesign, vision zero funding. Um, I believe that that year long process with RIPS gave you the report that you need and specific ways to implement um, and take actionable steps 
to really give us community safety here in San Jose. Thank you. Dilza, followed by Doris. I am a resident of District 5 for the last 20 years, a mother of four amazing children, a member of Somos Nature. I'm here in support of the memo that um, Council Member Peter Ortiz um, brought to the table, as well as to talk about the recommendations that you already have received from community from the recovery task force that was formed from community members. Um, organizations that represent our organizations and are actually on the floor with our community every day. We also have the Youth and Children Master Plan that talks about the needs of our families and children and youth. Listen to the community, listen to us. Our, our children and youth deserve a city in which they can feel safe, explore and grow. A city that puts their needs first. After school programs that have been several pillars, of child development and benefit families of all income levels, especially our extremely, extremely low income and low income families that have suffered enough within the COVID, um, within COVID. And even though we, we're in a, re in a recovery process, COVID is still real, COVID is still outside and it's affecting our families. Our families are getting infected, are getting sick and are not getting the resources that they need. Listen to the community once again. Thank you to Council uh, Member Peter Ortiz for putting our families first and bringing these issues um, into light and, and taking this step in. Have a really good day. Doris, followed by Mary. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Doris Livesey from District 1 for over 50 years. I'm calling in support of Mayor Mahan and the need for prioritizing the city budget. Please hire more staff and then focus your budget to homelessness, public safety, and blight. The city can't do it all as we've seen in the past. Let's save the other tasks for later. Thank you. Mary, followed by William. Thank you, Mayor Mahan, Vice Mayor Kamei, and Council Members. My name is Mary Gloner, a resident of District 6, part of the San Jose Committee for over 25 years, a nonprofit executive advancing youth mental health and suicide prevention, and a nonprofit racial equity action leadership coalition member. Based on my lived experience and as a community health professional, I would personally like to see city core services evolving so that the Office of Racial Equity is visibly as prominent as public safety CSA, rather than hidden as part of a strategic support. Until racial equity is a norm of city's culture, practice, and policies, it's important for accountability and resourcing this work beyond the pandemic recovery. I'm also here to ask city council to continue expansion of the city's civic engagement capacity through all parts of government, including budget planning, policy development, and service delivery, a fundamental approach that fosters and communicates commitment to equity. Evaluate and move forward priorities from reimagining public safety reports, such as the recommendation for a planning process to implement a community-based interpersonal violence prevention and response pilot in partnership with Next Door Solutions to Domestic Violence and Real Coalition. In closing, we support the memorandum from Council Member Ortiz and the ongoing priorities described in administration's memorandum. Thank you. William, followed by Antonia. William. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. My name is William Tyson, and I currently work for the City of San Jose as a firefighter paramedic. My family has lived in San Jose across several generations, and I am proud to serve the city that has been home to all of us for so long. Speaking on behalf of every paramedic, we enjoy the privilege in providing life-saving care to this community. However, we are frustrated by the failures of our city to provide adequate staffing for such an important foundational service to your constituents. The repercussions of these failures is felt not only by those of us who are being forced to work the extremely high cost of overtime, but also by the underserved community members of all of your districts across the city. Everyone in this city, which includes everyone in this public forum, is entitled to receive the most fundamental right of having a paramedic show up when they dial 911. There are 
currently 107 active paramedics in this department. With a budget that already accounts for 174 paramedics for staffing, this gives us 67 vacancies, a vacancy rate of nearly 40%. But let that sink in as I quickly continue with these important remarks. This problem has been shared by departments across the Bay Area. Over the last few years, neighboring departments have been aggressive in recruiting, hiring, and retaining their paramedics to meet their needs, but we have unfortunately been lackluster, to say the least, in our priorities to hire the necessary amount of paramedics. We continue to allow other fire departments the opportunity to recruit and hire before us time and time again. We will miss out on not only gaining ground on the number of paramedics we need to hire, but also miss out on being able to hire a diverse and inclusive workforce that shares our department's vision. Lastly, Paramedics are the cornerstone of the San Jose Fire Department. Just yesterday, this department supplemented Santa Clara County with 16 transports. If this is to continue, the available life-saving capabilities of paramedics at your fire stations in your community will be unable to arrive when they are needed most. Thank you, Mayor. Council, it was a pleasure to speak on behalf of so many. Antonia, followed by Matt. It could be Antonia. Hello. Hi. Oh, hola. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchan? I don't have an interpreter for this part of the meeting. Buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchan? Can... Okay, Angel said go ahead. Sí. Muy bien. Voy a, voy a dar mi testimonio. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Antonia Sandoval. Muy buenas tardes al señor alcalde y miembros del ayuntamiento. Uh, yo vivo y trabajo en la ciudad de San José y he vivido y trabajado por más de 20 años, lugar donde nacieron y crecieron mis hermanas y sobrinos. Se Estos dos señora, últimos... señora, ¿Perdón? Le, le vamos a traducir un poco, pero si uh, pudiera dar unos, uh, una pausa para poder traducir un poquito. Claro. Adelante. Angel, are you going to translate or are we going to? I, I can't hear you, Angel. The, the, tr the translator is asking the speaker to pause, so uh, she, I think she's no. ready. I, I, I guess I, I, I misunderstood as to who, who yeah. was going to do the translating. Yeah, I don't have an, an interpreter for this part of the meeting. My interpreters don't come in until 1.30. Oh. So I thought you, when you were nodding to me, you were telling me you could interpret for her. I could interpret for her. Okay. Okay. So can you summarize what she just said, and then we'll give her another two minutes? Because it's four minutes when somebody has an interpreter. Why don't we have her start all over again? Yeah, let, let's, have her, let's have her start all over again, and, and we will have her pause more frequently. Okay. Señora, ¿puede, Señora, ¿puede comenzar uh, de nuevo? Sí, claro. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Antonia Sandoval. Vivo y trabajo en la ciudad de San José, lugar donde he vivido y trabajado por más de 20 años. She lived in San Jose, uh, worked and lived here for 20 years. Lugar donde nacieron mis hermanas y mis sobrinos. Yo vivo con mi madre, una persona mayor. Vivo con mis dos sobrinos. Estos dos últimos, desafortunadamente, fueron abandonados por sus padres. Mi madre y yo nos hemos hecho cargo de ellos desde que eran niños de dos años. She's lived with her sisters and her nephews uh, over the course of those 20 years, and there's been uh, some abuses that have taken place. Y por eso es que estoy aquí dando mi testimonio para dejarles saber a los miembros del concilio lo difícil que ha sido para nosotros, para mi madre y yo, salir adelante cuidando dos niños, ahora ya jóvenes. And so uh, she, she wants to convey how difficult and challenging it has been for her, for her and her mom uh, raising the, the, the young ones uh, and, and, and living in the city here. Hemos trabajado día con día arduamente para sacarlos adelante, pero desafortunadamente la vida es muy difícil y no es culpa de nosotros, es culpa del sistema que cada día nos desplaza más a los pobres. They have worked work real hard to try to overcome and get ahead, but uh, it's, not, it's not their fault. It's, it's part of the system that has kind of created some of these obstacles. 
Por eso estoy aquí dando mi testimonio para pedirles a, a los miembros del concilio que aprueben el presupuesto, que aprueben la oportunidad de darle a la comunidad como nosotros, donde viven mis sobrinos que desafortunadamente fueron abandonados por sus padres, para que tengan la oportunidad de crecer en un ambiente saludable y feliz. So she's offering her, her testimonial to the, to the mayor and council so that uh, they can support uh, efforts to kind of help uh, in situations like these. Um, it's been real tough for her and her family, uh, raising uh, especially the, the children and their family. Les pido por favor que aprueben los recursos para nuestra comunidad, para que jóvenes como mis sobrinos tengan la oportunidad de crecer y tener un lugar donde ellos puedan llamar hogar, donde tener una oportunidad donde ellos salgan y puedan crecer en una comunidad feliz, donde puedan tener recursos para ayudar con su salud mental. So she's asking for, <coughs> for support, uh, for, for services uh, to help. Uh, <clears throat> help her family in, in, in situations, uh, especially with, with raising of, of young people. Uh, she, she basically is deploring the mayor and council to, to fund and support programs that support families in her sí. city. Sí, les pido de favor que les den la oportunidad a jóvenes de crecer en un ambiente saludable, jóvenes como mis sobrinos que desafortunadamente no tuvieron la oportunidad de crecer con sus padres. Entonces ahora yo les pido a los miembros del concilio que tampoco ellos les fallen, de que les den la oportunidad de crecer en una comunidad feliz, de que les den los recursos para que ellos puedan crecer feliz. Por favor, que no les fallen ellos también. She, she's asking the, the, the council not to fail um, the, the children, uh, and, and, uh, and, she, and she, she's given examples several times about her, her nephews who have had a challenging time being raised, given some abandonment uh, issues uh, that they've experienced in their family, and so she's asking uh, the council not to fail uh, her family and other families like theirs <coughs> uh, here in our city. Sí, muchas gracias por su atención. Les agradezco mucho y gracias. She thanks you for your attention. Okay, Matt, followed by Cheryl. Hi, thank you. My name is Matt Tuttle, and I am president of San Jose Firefighters Local 230. Our citizens deserve basic services, and the vacancy rates of employees throughout the city is not allowing for that to occur. Specific to the fire department, there are currently 60 plus paramedic vacancies in San Jose alone. This was both predictable and preventable and our paramedics are working an average of 96 plus hours per week. A problem that has persisted for far too long. We now have multiple times a week fire apparatus responding to calls with no paramedics on them. Our citizens and our paramedics deserve better. Our citizens should not have to worry about whether or not they will get a paramedic on scene when they call 911. Our paramedics shouldn't have to wonder when they get their next day off. We have fire stations that are falling apart, leaks in roofs, broken appliances, and not having enough equipment to do our jobs. We need a budget that reflects these issues and addresses them because the public is at risk. Thank you. Cheryl followed by Paula. Hi, yeah, this is Cheryl. I live uh, downtown in District 3. And I support Mayor Mahan's focus on key areas and basic services. Economically, we are on a rocky road with a lot of uncertainty. The city's approach should be the same as any household with financial constraints. Make sure the basic services are met, differentiate needs versus wants, and plan for unexpected expenditures. Public safety should be key. Whether it's kids walking to school, people hanging out at a park, people who live on the streets being able to connect with services, domestic abuse victims being able to access services or call for police intervention, availability of emergency services, or people feeling safe going downtown or elsewhere in the city. And a top priority, something has to be done to help the people who are living on and suffering on the streets. How can people have dignity if they're living by a creek without basic services or regular healthy meals or cleanliness? But even with setting priorities, it shouldn't mean that any areas are left out, whether it's wage staff, park services, or other services. Services. Let's face it, everything is important to someone, but it's a matter of streamlining everything. We need to focus on basic services, streamline everything, and partner with other agencies to tackle root causes of other issues. The city cannot focus on 
a great number of things and do a good job at it. We need to partner with others. We need to have a strong focus on what we can do well. Thank you. Paula, followed by Carmen. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Paola Mondragon, and I am a lifelong San Jose resident, especially of District 5. Um, families like mine work hard every day so that our children can have access to the care opportunities and experience that they need to live full lives. Last year, the city began working on a plan to ensure the city's various youth programming channels that can be integrated making it easier for families like mine to access them through the years. I'm here to ask that this plan receive the funding it's needed so that it can continue into the next fiscal year. We cannot put our kids' futures on the back burner. Their well-being needs to be front and center, which is why I urge the city council to prioritize these essential programs in this year's budget. As we think about what we want to see in our budget, we should always consider the ways in which we can secure the future for our families. Our children and youth deserve a city in which they can feel safe, in which they can explore and also grow. These programs are not extras, but they're essential to our young people. I urge the city council to consider council member or thesis memo that highlights why we need to prioritize our kids and our youth. It's time for a more equitable and resilient San Jose, one in which the well-being of our young people is front and center in our budget. Please support a San Jose budget for all that centers youth and family services as a key focus. Thank you. I'll just interject quickly. Sarah Garcia on my team is here to offer translation for anyone who might need it. We do, as a standard practice, uh, we endeavor to have translators here. I know we have our translators at 1.30, yep. our usual translators. This was, I think, an oversight. The clerk owns this process and we'll make sure we have translators going forward but for Spanish language translation Sarah's happy to step in if anyone needs support there thank you Carmen followed by Shiloh greetings uh, my name uh, is Carmen Gaines and San Jose is my hometown and I am a resident of district 3 Currently, I work as the associate director with the nonprofit Local Color with the mission of building equitable pathways for local artists to thrive. I want to express my gratitude for City Council for including downtown vibrancy as a priority for the city's budget. My public comment is to advocate for continued funding for the Abierto program and similar initiatives that maintain and support the creative communities here in San Jose. Artists are second responders in matters of health, public safety, and calls for equity. And the activities funded through similar initiatives have helped with the recovery of the city and building back community cohesion. I urge City Council to continue to prioritize the cultural vibrancy found in every neighborhood and district of the city by supporting programs like Abierto and Take Park. Thank you for your attention to this matter and for your continued support of the arts in San Jose. I would like to yield the rest of my time. Shiloh, followed by Erica. Good afternoon, my name is Shiloh Ballard and I'm executive director of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. We participated on the mayor's transition committee that covered traffic enforcement and we're pleased with the traffic enforcement related elements of the recommendations. We also support the memo by council member Ortiz and the comments of our colleagues here today from uh, the real coalition surge and labor. Um, specific to the Vision Zero recommendation, we'd love, we, we love seeing the commitment to building out the Vision Zero action plan and in particular to do so at a much faster clip. Street design as a solution is super awesome. It marries many of the reimagining public safety committee's goals to reduce interactions with the police while improving safety for all. Um, also, I wanted to caution you all on thinking that the completion of the Vision Zero plan will be enough because it won't be. The plan only targets the city's worst areas where we have the most traffic violence, which is important, but on average, the city has 20 crashes a day. That's 20 crashes police and fire respond to, which is a complete waste of police and fire time. And so, while Vision Zero will reduce the worst of the worst traffic violence, it is only one of many plans that need to be built to create safe streets for all. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that you all have lots of hard decisions to make, and so it's a fair question for those of us in the street safety world, um, like why should we fund this over that? 
Uh, first, please don't think of this only as a spending issue. You all can control the revenue side of the equation, and you should help pass measures that increase revenues to the city. Um, that said, why should street safety be a priority? Because you are completely responsible for the streets. If streets are not safe, it is your fault. I, as a public citizen, cannot do anything about that, which is different than other city-related functions where the need is not so great. For example, if I'm upset that someone steals a package off my porch, I could have it delivered somewhere else. I control that. Erica, followed by Brian. Good afternoon, City Council members and Mayor Mahan. My name is Erica Valentine. I am the political director for UA Local 393, the plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, and HVACR technicians for Santa Clara and San Benito County with over 3,100 members. I'm also a resident of the city of San Jose and have been for over 20 years and appreciate our entire community that we have here. I'm here to ask for the support of the city budget, specifically council member Ortiz's memo. I would like to emphasize the importance on wage theft and responsible construction ordinances. Our city is the leader in the entire United States as well as the world. We need to have ordinances in place to ensure that we have that innovation and technology in the buildings that we are building and those that are building them for us. So with that, I ask that you support Council Member Ortiz's memo. Thank you. Brian, followed by Tina. Hello, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thank you for your time. My name is Brian Pores. I'm a business rep also with UA Local 393, the plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, and HVACR technicians here in Santa Clara and in San Benito County, uh, representing over 3,100 members. I was also born and raised here in San Jose. And I'm here to ask you to support a city budget that prior prioritizes the needs of all San Jose residents, specifically the prevention of wage, wage theft and the enforcement of a responsible construction ordinance. We need a budget that will benefit the majority, not the few. We need a budget that is grounded in economic justice, a budget that is focused on root causes and uh, identifying long-term solutions. We need a budget that prioritizes policies to incentivize, incentivize developers who work with contractors that do pay their workers family sustaining wages. A responsible construction ordinance would strongly incentivize, incentivize these new developers to work with contractors who do treat their workers with dignity and pay a fair return on their work. I thank the council and mayor for your time and thoughtfulness in this process and implore you to prioritize a city budget for all. I support Council Member Ortiz's memo, memo that calls for stronger policies when it comes to protecting working people's wages and urge Council to include it in their decision making. Thank you. Tina, followed by Araceli. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tina Morrill. I live in the Vendom neighborhood, District 3. Um, I've lived there over 20 years, and I'm calling in to say that I heartily support Mayor Mahan's um, need for a greater focus and prioritization um, of a few things, basic things, that really need to be done and done well. Basic project management tells us that, you know, you can't focus on a zillion different things without having you know, enough resources to do so. And right now, you know, the economy is, is a little bit shaky. Um, I really appreciated what one of the previous speakers said about you know, when, when you're running your household, you look at the basics and you get those done and then you work on other things. I did not see um, this proposal in, um, as a zero sum game. I do uh, unfortunately reap the uh, repercussions of the city trying to do way too many things um, while the basics just fall by the wayside. So I support Mayor Mahan and, um, and the proposal. Thank you. Araceli followed by, followed by Lonnie. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Araceli. I'm a political organizer with SCIU USWW and also um, a San Jose resident, um, D7 constituent. I'm here to ask you to support a city budget that prioritizes the needs of 
all San Jose residents. Currently in San Jose, it's easier for an employer to get away with stealing wages from working people than it is for even one of those people to receive support in getting paid what they are owed. Our city administrators should be responsible to people, not wealthy developers and contractors who are willing to pay their fair share. As a city, we give developers millions of dollars in public subsidized a year, and yet some of these same developers continue to hire contractors and some contractors with a history of cheating and abusing workers. A responsible construction ordinance would strongly incentiv incentivize new developers to work with contractors who treat workers with dignity and fair and pay a fair return on their work. I thank the council and mayor for your time and thoughtfulness in this process and implore you to prioritize a city budget for all. I support council member Ortiz's memo that calls for stronger policies when it comes to protecting worker, working people wages and urge council to include it in their decision making. Thank you. Lonnie followed by Carmen. My name is Lonnie Ballard. I'm a resident of District 2, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. And I'd like to say as a senior, I'm always concerned about neighborhood safety, but community safety is paramount not only to me, but to all of my many diverse neighbors. When they feel safe, I feel safe. I do feel that our community can often be supported in ways that do not always include our Safety alternatives in the areas of mental health and traffic control come to mind. Therefore, I'm supporting the recommendations made by the Reimagining Public Safety Committee, including safe traffic control design and vision zero funding. In addition, I would hope the council's priorities would be centered around our community's most valuable, most vulnerable residents. Thank you for listening. Carmen, followed by Mundo. Hi, I'm Carmen Brammer from District 8. I'm a former candidate for the District 8 Council of Vacancy, political strategist, and a community advocate. I support recommendations from the year-long community reimagining public safety process that's centered on people with lived experiences. San Jose's system is structurally and systemically racist. When, budgets, when funding budgets, San Jose continues to allocate very little to improve and uplift the black and brown communities that have been and continue to be harmed. With this year's budget, our city can walk the talk by furthering public safety reform, including evaluating and moving forward achievable priorities from the RIPS report, specifically the RIPS recommendation for a planning process to implement a community-based interpersonal violence prevention and response pilot to domestic violence in partnership with Next Door Solutions to Domestic Violence and the Real Coalition. Thank you. Mundo followed by Jeremy. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Edmundo Escarcega. I'm a lifelong resident of San Jose, and I'm here to ask that you support a city budget that prioritizes the needs of all San Jose residents, specifically the prevention of wage theft and the enforcement of a responsible construction ordinance. Last year, over 19,000 workers filed claims with the state alleging wage theft totaling more than $338 million. That's one third of a billion dollars in claims of stolen wages. These are not dollars saved by the city, instead wages not paid to the hardworking people that build our cities and try to make a living. Enough is enough. We need bold action to protect work workers from such egregious exploitation and wage theft. We should strongly incentivize, incentivize new developers to work with contractors who treat workers with dignity and pay a fair return on their work. I'm born and raised here. I started a five-year plumbing apprenticeship when I was 18. I accrued zero student debt and, and medical benefits, and I'll be able to retire with dignity when that time comes, all while remaining a resident of San Jose, paying taxes here, and most, most importantly, staying out of trouble here, and I kept from becoming a statistic. We cannot take this lightly or move this down on our list of priorities. Let's not chase our own tails by working so hard to house our own unhoused residents on one hand and then create more unhoused people on the other hand by turning a blind eye to wage theft. 
I'm very grateful for the work for the work each of you is putting into deciding our budget and priorities. <clears throat> but our ability to earn an honest living must be a key focus area in our budget. Thank you. Jeremy followed by Robert. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. This is Jeremy Barus, Director of Policy and Organizing with Amigos de Guadalupe, Center for Justice Empowerment. We serve our wonderful families in East San Jose. I'm here to urge the Council to support the memo authored by Councilmember Ortiz and support a city budget that prioritizes the needs of our San Jose residents and specifically to make sure youth and family services are explicitly named as focus areas in the budget process. At Amigos de Guadalupe, we are serving families who are still climbing back after falling behind due to the COVID pandemic. Our youth need tons of support to close the opportunity gap in our schools, develop mentally and socially, and in our need of core community resources. Unfortunately, our most vulnerable parents and kids are not sufficiently served by the city due to a lack of dedicated programming and resources. We must better fund programs that enrich the next generation of San Jose residents and renew the city's commitment to caring for kids and youth for, from working families. Through our budget process, our city can stand up for families and make a major statement that we don't leave anyone behind. Thank you for your time. Robert, followed by Mike. I'm Bob Brownstein. Good afternoon. I'd like to challenge the argument that San Jose can't have a broad uh, budget that serves many interests and accomplishes a lot of important things. For eight years, I was on the staff of Mayor Susan Hammer. She took office in the middle of a recession, and while she was mayor, the state stole $80 million from the city through the ERAF scam. Despite that, she brought Cisco and Adobe to San Jose. She negotiated the San Jose, San Jose State Joint Library Project. She launched major public safety initiatives, the Mayor's Gang Task Force in San Jose Best. She created Project Diversity to bring more people of color into boards and commissions. She put a library homework center in every single council district and significantly expanded youth services. And she was one of the strongest supporters of the arts in the history of San Jose. Is it possible to have a budget for all in San Jose? There's no question it's possible. It's been done before. What does it require? Values, will, and skill. Thank you. Mike, followed by Jill. Good afternoon, Mayor, Manager, and City Council. My name is Mike. I'm a local firefighter and have lived in San Jose almost my entire life. I'm here today to ask for your help with what I believe to be the most pressing and delicate situation that the city currently faces. I'm talking about the paramedic staffing crisis that we are currently facing, which leaves the city in a dire situation. As a paramedic firefighter, we provide life-saving procedures, medication, and skill set to the people of San Jose every day, multiple times a day. And at this moment, all of us are working an average of 96 to 120 hours per week, every week. We have already lost four paramedics to other departments, which means that the city has lost hundreds of thousands of dollars that it has invested in them. We are exhausted, tired, and at a breaking point. We need your help, and most importantly, the people of San Jose need your help. We are at a nearly 40% paramedic vacancy rate, which means that current paramedics are beyond stretched thin, leading to extreme fatigue, burnout, injury, both mental and physical. The paramedics are out there, and they want to work. All other surrounding Bay Area fire departments are being proactive in their response to this issue, and the longer we wait, we will lose the opportunity for hiring a diverse and qualified workforce and candidates. With the extreme shortage of paramedics, it means that your constituents, adults, children, the elderly, the underserved, and the city's most vulnerable, the people who depend on us and you, the fire department, to show up within eight minutes from the time they call 911 to provide life-saving help will likely not get it in time and their outcomes will be worse. Currently, there is no plan for uh, another firefighter paramedic academy this year, and this problem will only get worse and deadly outcomes will become prevalent. I urge you, my parents urge you, the people of San Jose urge and beg you to direct the fire chief to begin the paramedic hiring process immediately and continuously. We need to budget for no less than three fully staffed and operational firefighter paramedic academies this next fiscal year just to reach the number of paramedics we are budgeted for. Thank you so much for your time. Jill? 
Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders. I'm a, a District 10 resident. I'm actually really grateful that I'm that I called in right now because I'm speaking to the last subject, the gentleman that was just on the phone regarding our lack of paramedics and the crisis that um, is certainly now and to follow. I want to just give you a quick idea for funding since this is about the budget, obviously. My daughter, um, three years ago as a senior, applied to the SBTC um, E programs, or formerly known as Metro. And you go three times a week, you, you're part of the fire and EMT program. That's what she wanted to do or wants to do for a living. And she was rejected out of the program because they cut it in half. And so my suggestion, to, and now she, two years later, or three years later, she is taking an EMT course at Foothill College and hopefully will be in the pipeline to be helpful in this situation and do what she wants to do. But three years ago, had we properly, you know, saw this coming and had staffed uh, or had money at budget in the budget at Metro, um, Metro Ed, you know, she could have already been in the pipeline working. My point is that there are 16, 17 and 18 year olds out there right now, 16 year olds who can sign up for this program if there is money in that budget. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is because several weeks ago, somebody mentioned it that in another meeting that this is something that we can fund. So if we can put money toward um, SBTCE community programs in the fire and EMT section, and we can get our people that are already housed, our 16 and 17 and 18 year olds living with their parents into these programs, we can, quickly get them into the working pipeline, doing what they want to do and being um, a contributing member and helping the shortage. So that's my idea. Thanks. Back to the council. Thank you. All right. I have a few colleagues coming back out to join us here as we head toward discussion. So thank you for all the public comment. Really appreciate it. And a lot of good suggestions. Appreciate folks emphasizing a number of critical issues, including filling vacancies, uh, continuing our work to further racial equity and justice and prevent wage theft, all of which I think are really important priorities and um, are things that will be certainly reflected in the budget message. And as you saw in the presentation, will be part of our ongoing work. And in a moment, I am gonna wanna go back to that slide just to make a couple of comments. But before we do that, um, you know, I hope that the Staff, as I was listening to public comment, you know, I hope that the staff presentation today made clear to members of the public that um, two, two things that are really important to keep in mind. One, I don't think that there is a zero-sum game or that having some focus areas is at all mutually exclusive from continuing critical work in other areas. And that's, that's why we fleshed out and, and showed um, the work being done under each of the, the CSAs. So I, I don't think there is any tension between having many priorities, many things that are important, and also at the same time saying there's some areas where we want to have more regular reporting, very clear metrics, push ourselves to be more experimental and ambitious, and, and try harder to move the needle. And, and I think it's important that we can do both. And so I think uh, we're hearing actually a lot of consensus on that. The second point I hope came through from the staff presentation was that we're just beginning the process. And I do take, I won't take it personally, but I take a little bit of issue with the idea that somehow this has not been transparent. I, I think this is probably the first time that either a mayoral transition process has reported out publicly or had council members involved. Um, this is also, I think, the, the first time that we've talked so explicitly uh, about the budget recommendations specifically before the March message is out. The March message traditionally has kicked off the process and actually been generally a black box up to that point. And then we have community meetings and a lot of discussion and debate heading toward the June message. So I just, I wanna set expectations that while priority setting did eventually make its way from being in the fall to being uh, timed before the message in March, this has probably been the most robust and open set of conversations we've, we've had. Um, so understand people, People are rightly very concerned about what's gonna be in the message, particularly as we see one-time federal money being spent down. And uh, we are gonna to have to make some tough trade-offs there with all of that one-time spending. 
Uh, we also anticipate economic uncertainty, to say the least, in the years ahead. And so, um, and we are structurally out of balance, as we'll talk about. So I think um, there's, there's good reason for folks to want to weigh in, and I appreciate all of the input. We will continue to have a series of meetings, as the slides showed, with public comment. Uh, I also would encourage for folks in the public who want to make sure their voices are heard, please also reach out to council members. We are in a representative system of government, and I do, we do rely on each of us to be hearing from our constituents and not just those who can make it to a meeting, but really synthesizing and taking a holistic view of, um, of kind of the, the needs of, of the community and, um, and the values and priorities of our constituents. So if we could put up slide 12 again, I just want to make this point about focus versus priorities and it not necessarily being a zero-sum game. We do have limited resources, but uh, I, I want to just you know, acknowledge, I'll take some random examples here, but you know, the community forest plan, something I'm personally very passionate about, I have a deep love for trees, uh, did not, I did not choose to suggest that we make that an area of focus because while there's critical work that we are doing there, and we are continuing to have staff execute against a plan, a plan that we recently weighed in on related to expanding our urban canopy, particularly with an equity lens. I didn't feel that it rose to the level of wanting to have regular reporting out by the city manager and a critical need for our entire community to see significant transformation there. Very important. Every bullet point you see here, critically important priority. And I just, I don't want anyone to think that because I'm suggesting that we have some focus areas where we're really disciplined about performance management, we're regularly reporting out on metrics, and we are pushing ourselves and maybe giving ourselves license to experiment more and to be more innovative and to make more mistakes, that that in any way means that things that we've prioritized aren't important or won't go on. Uh, all of these things that you see outlined as important continuing work is just that and will continue to be unless directed otherwise by the council. And that's an important part of this process as well. Rather than just keep adding new things in, I'd also encourage us all to reflect on, are there, is there anything here that should be lower priority that might free us up to put more energy and resources into other areas of work? So certainly things can come off of this list, new things can be added, but uh, did not want to leave anyone with the impression that the focus areas I've suggested somehow invalidate or cancel out or take away the importance of all the other work we have going on across the city. Uh, in the, so we can take down the slide. And then finally, uh, I want to thank, I, two of our colleagues have submitted memos, and they're great. They're exactly the kind of feedback I was hoping to get in this meeting. So thank you to council members Ortiz and Doan for your memos. Um, this is exactly what I want to hear, because I want our budget message to the best of my ability, and again, this is not something we've traditionally done. Typically, the mayor puts out a budget message that's had very limited input. Uh, I want to do my best to synthesize everybody's perspectives and priorities, and so having this kind of explicitly written out is really useful, and we will absolutely incorporate that into our work, and I hope that we can hear from all the other council members up here today what other priorities you have and what you want to make sure is reflected in that message, and my team will be listening, I and my team will be listening um, very, very carefully in taking notes. So we're going to move into the feedback portion of the meeting, and I will look to see who has put up their hand, and we will get into it. Okay, Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I share my thanks to city staff for producing the staff report and enlightening uh, the process that was challenging, at least for myself, to follow. And I think we heard from some members of our community it was challenging as well. Likewise, I'd like to share my thanks with those members of uh, the community who participated in the mayoral transition committees. We appreciate your, your commitment to public service. As we navigated the mayoral transition committees, um, for myself, not, a, not saying a lack of transparency, but at least a clarity as to when we would be able to make the priorities of our, our districts known. For example, in the 2020-2021 Council Priority set, Setting Process, 
Um, it provided a policy nomination form uh, for council districts, which the mayor and council members could use to bring forward priorities for the consideration. And I understand that um, uh, yeah. the conversation originally that we had is for the mayor's budget message, but <coughs> if we're going to be matching that in, in, uh, in agreement with the priority setting, um, what is considered a, a priority for the city of San Jose is usually how we fund uh, the overall budget. So it was concerning uh, to myself. So what I'm proposing with my memo is a clarification of the process to ensure that residents and my council colleagues can feel secure in knowing that our work surrounding our enterprise priorities, um, which, which are critical, can continue. Um, I've also set forth a proposal to continue the execution of the 42 initiatives as directed by the council on the fiscal year 2022 through 2023 city roadmap. Uh, many of the initiatives listed on the roadmap is critical work uh, to our city and we must continue, such as citywide hiring, which impacts all priorities, I believe, um, vision zero traffic safety uh, and work plan, and of course, uh, the future of our city, which is the children and youth services master plan. Um, I'm also interested in understanding um, how staff will move forward policy proposals through the Rules Committee moving forward, understanding that this will allow uh, respective council offices to position themselves uh, efficiently. That being said, um, I would like to motion to accept my memo and also include um, recommendations from Councilmember Biendone's memo, one, two, four, five, six, and seven. Um, I'm happy to, to have a conversation around Number three, I'm just, I'm, in regards to, this seems like a, a huge strategy change for the city, so I just would like to have more information in regards to that. So uh, one, two, four, five, six, and seven, I would like to initially include in my, in, in my motion. And of course, um, this can be amended as council begins to add any sort of priorities. I'm, I'm happy to extend that. But uh, I, I would like to move my memo. Thank you. Second. Yeah. And, and Nora, do you want to just clarify? So we'll, we'll be taking the feedback from everyone, whether or not there are any memos moved. We'll, all of the feedback that's outlined on people's priorities will be, at least for purposes of my office and, and bringing forward a budget message, we'll be accepting all of the feedback today from all council members. I appreciate just, that. Just so everybody's clear. And I think that, as you saw in the presentation today, I think the urgent, important, continuing work is already in progress. I don't know if we want to just clarify what we've agendized. I think we're giving feedback on the staff report and then general feedback to uh, me and my office for the March message. But I don't think there's anything in conflict with what's here. I don't know, Nora, if you want to weigh in. Uh, sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there's nothing um, in conflict necessarily. Uh, recommendation number one on, under Councilmember Ortiz's memo. Um, is to accept the staff report and yep. add some things to the staff report, which is um, part of um, the uh, Agenda 1A, accepting the report. Mm -hmm. um, the other two items, two and three, uh, it, it sounds as though from the discussion that those are things that uh, ultimately may uh, be considered by uh, the mayor and the manager as uh, budgets are coming forward and um, I believe are going to be part of um, a, a future process as the uh, um, mayor's message comes forward and council has an opportunity to uh, provide specific recommendations. Um, but the uh, agenda for today is, is um, feedback on, on the items that are on the agenda. That said, um, I, I, my understanding is that items two and three, and I may be wrong, um, but my understanding is the, uh, the administration is uh, uh, planning to do those things as we move forward through this process. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. And just, um, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. Th thank you, Mayor and Council Member. Just uh, Council Member Ortiz on your member, uh, memorandum for recommendation to that is work as we outlined in our presentation that um, those urgent and important 
needs that are that we highlighted as part of our presentation or that are on the existing roadmap. That's work that we will continue to do until otherwise directed to stop um, or it finishes. And then uh, your third recommendation, which I really appreciate, you know, how we evaluate our, our own workload and the, the various policy recommendations that will come into rules. Um, I think we were planning as an administration um, to bring something forward um, as we figure out how everyone's going to, you know, in this model govern together. Um, we typically do the, the red light, yellow light, green light framework, which I think has actually served us really well. I think one of the changes, um, you know, that we had talked about at rules um, is that providing more focus gives us a little bit more latitude to address, you know, smaller urgent policy matters that arise throughout the course of the year, which we haven't had the ability to do. And then one thing our, our past rules committee really wanted was if it was a policy recommendation that aligned with something on the citywide roadmap, those items were typically greenlit. However, that just actually caused more work for the people handling those initiatives. So the, the goal line kept changing throughout the year. So likely what you're, all of you will see when this comes to the rules committee is us changing the way in which we analyze that workload um, and arrive at a, a green, yellow, and red light. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to do that, and we'll absolutely be bringing that forward to rules before June 30th. Thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to, a few a few more comments. Just want to reinforce uh, Councilmember Biendone's um, initiative to hire first responders. Um, absolutely, uh, San Jose. We need more San Jose police and firefighters. Um, also, uh, unsworn in city staff, the support team, those who also provide vital services should be weighted, which uh, I think is already a part of my recommendation with the overall citywide uh, hiring. Just wanted to include that. Thank you. Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and thank you to the staff for this very thorough um, report. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm also going to ask that slide 12 be put back up on the screen during my comments. Um, I appreciate Excuse the... Excuse me, I think we have a point of information oh, from your sorry. colleague. Go ahead, Councilmember Batra. Uh, on what are we approving today? Uh, because I see memos and we have the staff report. And, and I'm getting the impression that we are allowed to give the input about what is in the priority scheme, but we, if we approve any memos, that doesn't automatically become part of that stuff there, right? So there, yeah, there are two components to the meeting today. There's the staff memo that hopefully everyone read and we had the presentation. The action today is asking council to accept the staff report. The other piece is as part of the discussion here, I'm encouraging each of you, particularly those of you who are not in the Brown Act with me on the budget, to share what you hope to see in the March budget message, what your priorities are, things that weren't covered in the mayoral transition committees, what your priorities are. So I'm taking something like the memo here as feedback, but the March budget message, which ultimately we need to discuss and, and approve, is what sets the direction is what sets the direction uh, for the, for the, and that's just, that, that's not the final budget either, that's in June. So, so this is, today is really about feedback and accepting the staff memo. And, and the feedback came in the memos form from some of them, but others can give it just verbally. Verbally is perfectly fine. Thank you. Yes, okay. <laughs> Councilor Cohen, apologies. All right, um, slide 12. <laughs> anyway, uh, gives me a good starting point then. I'll start with, with that. Um, my, my hesitation on the motion itself is not that I don't agree with the, the recommendations in there, but that there's, I think a lot of us have other priorities that are not in those memos, and I just want to make sure that a vote today doesn't indicate that we are prioritizing the things that were in these two memos over the things that we will also be suggesting as important to us. So that's the, that's the hesitation I have with the motion itself. Um, I think we should give our input, and we all will hear that input, but, um, you know, I, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are important to me. Um, on, on slide 12, I'm going to ask a couple of things. One, um, and I talked to Kip about this yesterday. I know that you're, we're, we're asked five bullet points max and a certain 
and, and in order to make the slide look nice, everything had to have a certain number of lines. That doesn't necessarily lend itself to being thorough and complete as far as what our, our um, continuing work is. So it's important to me, after all the work we did in the last two years on, and several years before that, on reach codes and electrification and, and decarbonization, that those words are in this continuing work chart. Um, and so we talked about this yesterday, Kip. I, it says clean energy scaling. I know that's one of the first steps in achieving that. But I'd like to say, have it say clean energy scaling slash decarbonization or some words that, in, in, that indicate the importance of that as, in a, as an ongoing agenda for the city of San Jose. So that's my, one of my suggestions as far as this chart goes and as part of the ongoing work. And I know it's intended, but um, it's important for me to have that in there. And, and, and a few slides, actually it wasn't on a slide, but on the bottom I think there was a, there's a list of all those departments with all of the, the ongoing core services within those departments. Um, we also talked about this yesterday, but um, Climate Smart has, is a funded department within the Environmental Services Department, and I think it ought to be listed as a core service on that table under Environmental Services. So I want to make sure we have that in there to be clear that that is a funded priority of the city that the council feels is important and that the staff is working on. So that's a suggestion I'll make, and um, don't necessarily have a question on that one. Um, the, some of these items that are on the memos are, are things that are already here under the continuing work core services, so I appreciate that we will definitely be focused on that. We certainly can't achieve any of these things without a complete staffing hiring plan. I think that underpins all of this, and so, you know, making sure we do that. I, I know it's, it's just written, written in more of a, a, with jargon, making San Jose a great place to work on this table, but it should be clear this is about filling our staff positions, and so, I don't know if you want to comment on that. No, I would, I would agree the, the hiring and closing of our vacancy rate is absolutely one of the major priorities in that bucket um, and is expressed there. Um, and we're open to wordsmithing if, if we need to be uh, more specific about it. Yeah, I just want to make sure that it's clear to the public and everybody else. I mean, you know, we, 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 there's been a lot of confusion during this process. Is this included? Are we doing this still? If we're just going to give it a nice snappy name versus being very clear about what it is that is our priority, I don't know that that's as helpful. So I just want to, you know, make sure we have the right message being sent out. Um, want to comment a couple things, uh, question, maybe questions for staff or, or just comments on a couple things on Councilmember uh, Duan's memo. Um, the hiring and firing of police officers, clearly that's under the hiring of vacancies. That's under the filling of vacancies before we even talk about expanding because we, we know as we're a year or two out of even being able to expand because we still have to hire the positions that are already budgeted. Um, and as we talked about last year, I think making sure that we then balance, use our, our, we'll be able to reduce our overtime budget while staffing up our police department means it could be a net zero in the budget for this coming year. So is that a, is that a true statement? Uh, yes, the way that, absolutely, there. I mean, there's a few things there. So we do have vacancies in the police department that we need to focus on first before adding to positions. Um, with that said, our, our overtime budget, um, when it's approved by council is, I don't want to say relatively small, but is, is much smaller in totality because what we do is we take the savings from those vacancies, um, those unfilled positions, those unfilled shifts, and move those over to overtime. Right. Um, to fund the overtime that's needed to fill those gaps. So over time, that transaction and the amount that we spend on overtime would go down as we fill those vacancies. Right. So we're not necessarily needing to staff, to budget higher for the vacancies we want to fill in the next year. That is correct. Okay. Um, on number three, on I know this wasn't part of the, the motion, although, again, it's a, it's an, it was a priority of Councilmember Dewan. Having sat on the Homelessness Committee, Transition Committee, I just want to make a comment about at least my perception of, of um, the, the, the things that are in the way of us getting, making progress on homelessness. It's not necessarily the type of housing, or the, uh, but, but it's finding locations for housing. It's finding acceptable locations. It's fighting with the community over locations. It's trying to make an agreement. It's also about getting uh, cooperation with other agencies who we're trying to lease land from. We end up in a, in a bind every time. We've approved many sites. We have a plan. We have funding. We just can't do it because we don't have the properties. We're still working on that. I'm, I'm hopeful, actually, that we're going to start seeing some progress. But I just want be, to be clear, it's not necessarily um, a question of the type of housing even at this point or the type of, of prefab units or whatever, but about trying to 
really come up with those locations and communicate well with the public about why these are beneficial to our community. Um, let's see, the other, oh, the other thing I was gonna ask about is Vision Zero. Um, I know that that's important to all of us. Um, I know there's been a lot, there's been a lot of advocacy in the last couple weeks from people who are saying fully fund Vision Zero. So my question is, what does it mean? What does fully fund mean? <laughs> <laughs> what what does that actually translate to? Can someone uh, address that? Yeah, I want to have John Risto, our director of transportation, come down and handle that one. Thank you, Council Member John Risto, director of transportation. So we've got it almost half funded, uh, or actually a little bit more than half funded. The council uh, directed us to set up a program of about $25 million worth of work on the priority safety corridors, and there's 17 of those. We've got about, after this year's building, we're about 50% complete. So if we would fund the rest of that, we would finish off the rest of the identified corridor work that we, that we had identified in the action plan to do that. So with that remaining 12 million, we would complete just the corridors that we had identified work on. And one of the speakers, I think earlier, hit it correctly, Shiloh, that just because we get that Vision Zero plan of 25 million done doesn't end the work that we need to do to actually make all the roadways safer. So that is really just a first step that we had identified a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, Vision Zero is a starting point because of specific identified corridors. Many of us in districts that don't have any of those corridors have experienced fatalities, accidents, issues. We all work with you on those and try to make them better. But Vision Zero is not the, the those specific proposals is not the end of it. But back to the, the question about the funding, much of that funding is coming from third party sources and not from our general fund, right? Well, there, it, it, it's mostly coming from our construction excise taxes that come into our, our traffic capital program. We are augmenting throughout the city when we're able to actually go uh, compete for a grant that does come from an outside source, and we've been pretty successful over the last couple of years with that, but the identified 25 million is coming from city funds that come into our capital improvement program. And is the suggestion here then that the, that funding is limited so that we're going to come up $12 million short if we continue to fund it that way? If I'm understanding your question, it, those are all pol policy budget decisions that that the, is that, I'm not well, sure I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand I mean, the request to fully fund Vision Zero. I mean, I know you're saying there's a 20, $12 million more to finish right. it. Also, there's a time. We're not going to be able to do it all in one year anyway, even if we funded it all That's now. Correct. What is What would it look like in our, fund, in our budget this year to fully fund Vision Zero? I mean, it, we wouldn't just take $12 million out of the general fund and put it all right now into... Vision Zero. Would we? Council Member, do you mean based on our capacity to complete projects? Well, in a given and, and, and also period? what other sources of money there is and the conveyance tax that's actually earmarked for this. I mean, it, there's different sources of money. In I just, just mean when you say fully fund for this year, you mean based on the amount of capacity well, that you would too. have to complete that. On all those work. questions, though, are combined into that question. Okay. I mean, yeah, they, is, is there a staffing shortage in addition that also needs to be funded? Are there specific things we should fund in the general fund as we continue to use the other sources of revenue that will help us expedite some of the projects? and the revenue maybe exists, it's just a sh we're, we're slower. That, those are the kind of questions. Yeah, all, those ask. are all interrelated and tough questions in terms of if we had $12 million right now, could we deliver it? Probably not in a year. Um, we're, we're, we're pretty tapped out doing what the, the limits and the ability to deliver on all those projects, as well as a number of other projects we're mm -hmm. doing in terms of what our staffing is right now. Much of this depends on our ability to outreach to the neighborhoods that were areas that would get these pretty significant changes in roadway configuration, maybe remove a lane, change intersections, lots of things that go out onto the street. So we, it's a large part of it is the outreaching to the businesses and communities that may experience this. So that is, that takes time, but then we do deliver on those in the year. So I mentioned earlier in my remarks that we're gonna have a number of new projects that are we've been working on that have been funded this summer as we get those done. If we had the additional 12 million, we would put that into our program and deliver those in the next probably couple of years. Okay, I guess I'll, my time's up, so I'll just end it by saying, going forward, 
between now and the next month as we do the budget, we should get a better understanding of what are the short-term things we can fund that will help us move it further along and what are the other sources of funding we can, we can try to get and what kind of staffing changes do we need to do? Yeah, to, we can to, give to you all of that, that, whether we need to get a new team or what outreach and what a program or projects looks like if it's funded as 12 okay. million. Great, thank you. Yep. Great, thanks, Council Member. I also have noticed we have some members of the public arriving for our regularly scheduled meeting, which we had hoped to start at 1.30. We are still in the midst of a special meeting and uh, have a number of council members with hands up. So we're going to continue this meeting and then we will take a very short break to do the audio visual switch over. And uh, as soon as possible, we'll start the regular meeting. Okay, we are on to council member Candelas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna start off by thanking uh, staff for the background um, and the clarification, especially as it relates to providing the feedback um, on the suggested focus areas and other work prior to the release of, of the mayor's budget message. Um, I think it's important to, you know, for the community to understand what the city's core services and programs are. We have 98 core service areas, 264 programs that the city provide. That's a lot, uh, but it just shows that our residents depend on our city. Uh, with that, I wanna talk about a couple things. I wanna start off by talking about equity. Uh, staff mentioned this in their memo, but I wanna make sure we're using an equity lens um, on all the services we provide to residents. In November 2022, the, the voters passed Measure I with nearly 60% of the vote. Um, this measure requires the council to adopt equity value standards and assessments in our decision making. Um, the issue of equity is very important to our residents. Uh, in fact, when I was out in my district this weekend, um, residents emphasized the importance of equity in the priority setting process uh, during my pancake breakfast event. Um, um, and so, especially as it relates to where we're investing city funds and ensuring we're leading with intentionality on, it, on equity. Uh, that's, that's my first comment. Uh, the, next, and the next thing I'd like to quickly, quickly broach is homelessness. Um, I would like to highlight that to deal with homelessness, it has to be done on multiple levels. We should be building interim housing, um, as well as building long-term affordable housing. We have to maintain a balanced approach to our housing crisis, but most importantly, we have to remember that we have to be em empathetic in our approach. We cannot lose our humanity with dealing with this crisis. Um, you know, and so as you formulate your message, uh, Mayor, uh, you know, I'd, like to, I'd like for you to keep that in mind. Um, we're, we're, we're having the conversation about different focus areas as part of this meeting, and, and I, I don't want to lose sight of other programs, and I'm glad, um, Lee, you provi provided that clarity. Um, you know, I, I believe in early education and family learning after school programming um, and other programs like ed education, digital literacy, because that's important to residents of District 8. Um, library program and education services are, are critical pieces of what we do as a city, along with recreation services provided by PRNS. Uh, we should be looking at expanded library hours, expanded community center programs. School age children spend 80% of their waking time outside of school. You know, high, high quality after school program promotes positive youth development and, and offers our, our vulnerable kids a place where they can, um, you know, grow. Um, and, and honestly, it's, it's, it, it prevents vulnerable communities, which I represent, uh, per, from going down the wrong paths. Um, and, you know, lastly, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Peter Ortiz and, and Council Member Duan, um, uh, you know, for, for your memorandum, specifically as it relates to citywide hiring. Given our vacancies across the city, whether it's the planners, building inspectors or firefighter paramedics. That's, that's important. Vision zero traffic safety is important. Uh, children youth service master plan, uh, developing a simplified permitting process for mom and pop shops, um, and, and revitalizing, our, our, revitalizing our downtown through incentives. Um, all are critical topics to keep in mind as we can, can you know, continue the city's work on this budget, and, and, uh, and, and I thank staff for their presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Duan. Thank you, Mayor uh, Mahan, and your staff and your city manager office and other staff members who gave us direction and guidance on this year's budget process. The five main recommendation doesn't mean it's an all be all. It doesn't stop any other project. It doesn't stop other important issues that bring on onto our agenda. I just want to make the public to be clear uh, that the five main focus 
to deal with our city. We can't deal with the basics. We can't deal with the five focus, which have many other sub items below. We, we can't really do deal with smaller items. So if we deal with the main items, then we have the energy, the funding, the knowledge to deal with the sub items. Over the past few years, the process for the budget has been long and tedious. We end up with overloading with great ideas. It's nice to have, but it's, is it specific? Is it measurable? And is it be able to be implemented with finance and resource and the time behind it? And it's proven that when we have plethora of ideas without the finance resource and time, it become a failure. So the process this year was focused on core essential, which each of the city council inaugurated in January, chairing and co-chairing committees, both of their ideas and the public ideas were heard, discuss, rank with subject matter expert in the committee room. But this process gave us the ability to provide input that one subject. The process encouraged council members to provide their input in other area, areas of the budget today. And I just want to thank you, the, the mayor and his team and city staff, for that opportunity. According to the survey, homelessness is number one concern for residents in San Jose right now. Permanent housing solutions are just too slow to build, especially at the cost of a million dollars per apartment unit. This means too many people are suffering and waiting for help every single day. And the building of these housing continues to skyrocket, meaning the system is unsustainable especially in the economic downturn we are heading into, to include inflation on top of that. Addition to every one person that we house, there are more, there are three more become homeless. So my proposal of developing a campus-like environment as recommended in the transitional committee report we also do so with prefabricated sprung-like structures. Uh, the same system our soldier oversees and many other cities like San Diego, San Francisco, Hawaii have housed our unhoused resident temporarily. We have a choice. We either, either have tempor house, temporary housing or transitional housing, or we leave our unhoused resident out there on the street. Not only affecting our residents, but affecting our businesses. It affects the city as a whole. The spring like structure can house, can temporarily house up to 200 people per structure. And we've proven that right there, right behind the convention center. We're able to put that sprung, sprung up structure in less than 30 days. And the money that is left over to support and to prevent our resident to become homeless. The second issues I like to bring up is public safety is paramount. I understand that, yes, we need to concentrate on filling the position, but a lot of it, our money right now is going to overtime. And we, we just only concentrate and fill in the position that we have. We're not looking forward to the future of making sure our city staffing and our city being a safe, livable, and thriving community. I want to make sure that we hire more sworn officer and firefighter. 
we cannot get away from this and the lack of first responders in our city. That is directly propor proportional to the increase in crime and reduce in services we all have seen. The second public safety is to invest money in building new station and repair our existing firehouse. Firefighters in our city live in stations 48 to 72 hours a week. They are part of our residents. The current condition of some of our fire station is morale killing. It has asbestos, lead, mole, water that is undrinkable and unsanitary living condition. Repairing these facility will bring immediate boost to our fire department to keep them healthy so when we need the help, they can perform. Last but not least, we want to make sure that our paramedic, paramedic hiring is a top priority as well. My next proposal is the Department of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. My office, just like many colleagues, had received numerous complaints, numerous complaints, involving the fee of the structures for permits, and they extended time to do so. Some larger company hired expert in San Jose fees to calculate the cost why other mom and pop type residents just gave up. And say the process is too time consuming, demanding, com confusing, and expensive. I propose we develop a simple fee structure. One for the mom and pop and the smaller business and other drilling over four units, this way price or easy to understand, affordable, and quick to turn around because after all, time is money in this world. Lastly, rebuilding our downtown is extremely important to our entire city. We need a destination spot with restaurant, nightlife, sporting events to attract tourism into the city of San Jose make it a fun and a safe destination. This will increase our tax rate. This will allow us to earn money to build up our core services, build up our infrastructures. All of my previous recommendation will help make this reality. But additionally, we need to provide businesses with incentive to not only set up here in the city, the city of San Jose, but downtown, but to make it thrive. I propose that we have our staff examine ways of incentivize businesses to return to downtown San Jose. Please incorporate my proposal into the Mayor March budgeting message. And I just want to point out to Council Member Cohen, in order to house every single unhoused resident here in San Jose, it would cost us $6.65 billion and over what amount of time? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, and every single unhoused resident that we house, there's three more coming. If we choose to permanent housing, we're looking at 10, 5, 10, 15 years, and then we're looking on to more unhoused residents that we're going to have to deal with. My memo accept and incorporate Council Member Ortiz memorandum, and it's already been motion and second. I just want to say thank you very much for hearing my thoughts. Thank you, Councilmember. Appreciate all of that feedback. We'll go on to Councilmember Torres. Great. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you to my colleagues for the robust 
uh, discussion. I also want to say thank you to our city staff and our community members who worked so hard on this, uh, on the transition committees. So, so where we allocate our budget reflects what we value. And if we truly value equity and racial justice, we need to and we must allocate funds and invest in expanding our ev eviction diversion program that is set to end at the end of June. Our city still has a tsunami of evictions in San Jose, and my district has two zip codes out of the four that are most hardest hit. And as a city council, we need to continue to ensure that our families do not fall into homelessness or move away because of the lack of affordability. That is why we need to prioritize creating affordable housing, especially permanent supportive housing for our families and for our unhoused. And we need to continue to invest in our youth, so via the Youth Master Plan, maintaining library hours, especially on Sundays, and ongoing programs for our youth, such as after-school programming or community centers. Revitalizing our small businesses is a must, and we cannot forget the recommendations set forth by the, community, the community's COVID Economic Recovery Task Force. There is plenty of recommendations in, in that task force that is going to help us revitalize our downtown businesses, but our businesses throughout the city of San Jose. We also have to make sure that we continue to crack down on wage theft. It's an epidemic, especially in our working class community. Our reimagining police task force as well. We all know that the killing of George Floyd was horrible, horrendous. But it created, unfortunately, it created a conversation. And so there are recommendations from that task force where our community wants us to respond alternatively from police when we deal with domestic violence, especially in our immigrant and LGBTQ communities, youth interactions, or when dealing with our unhoused who are mentally unstable. But most importantly, we cannot accomplish all these goals or all these recommendations if we do not have the employees here in our city. So we have to fill our vacancies. We continue to hear it at all of our committees, at our community meetings, our constituents. And I've said it once, especially since I've been a often on again, off again employee for the city for over 20 years, we cannot make public employees public enemy number one. They are not public enemy number one. They serve our city day in, day out, and we need to continue to have their backs and we need to make sure that we are filling the 1,000 or so vacancies that we have here in our city of San Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I agree that's a critical issue for us. We'll go on to Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you so much. Um, many of the things that are important to me have uh, been discussed by my colleagues, so I thank you so much for that. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much to the staff. You know, we really do a lot, right? And, you know, you keep hearing about the vacancies and, you know, trying to uh, uh, get better at the recruiting, trying to get better at, you know, bringing people in. But we've done a tremendous job. So I want to congratulate everyone out there who is part of the team that does the work day in, day out, doing the overtime, uh, doing all the hard work, because it is hard work. So uh, I, I really want to say thank you, first and foremost. Um, second, I, I understand, you know, uh, Council Member Candela has mentioned that we have uh, 98 core services. That's also a lot. And so I, 
I really, as I think about all of the work that we uh, do, all of the work that has been done, I do recognize that there are trade-offs because we do have competing uh, interests, different services. Uh, Council Member Cohen mentioned, you know, what does it mean when we say we want to fully fund Vision Zero? I think that we have to really think about what we say and what we mean, right? Because it could have many different interpretations. So I'm hoping that as we move forward through this budget process, that we become a little bit more clear. We ask, the public has asked us for transparency and transparent in what are we saying and what do we mean by what we say. Uh, there had been a lot, a lot of this federal funding, one-time funding. There were things that we're not going to do simply because we don't have the money to do some of those things. And that's going to be very, very difficult. I want to acknowledge that up front because I do know those are extra dollars that came in through the federal government, right? And, you know, I think that many previous community engagement meetings have uh, surfaced valuable information. I think that we should take that in and, and really figure out these are the things we're able to do. So I would like to uh, uh, get information from staff in terms of what can we accomplish with our current resources, whether it's the dollar amounts or it's the current staff. I think that earlier when we talked about Vision Zero, even if you had the money, if you don't have the staff, you're limited in what you can do. So I think that if we can daylight that a little bit, that will be very helpful because then that gives more information to the community on, you know, what can you expect and, and not have these ideas of, of things that we hope that can happen, but don't because we don't have staff. So I think that, um, you know, I too have priorities in terms of having that equity lens. I'm delighted that it's going to be throughout everything we do. Uh, same thing with looking at uh, community safety. I think that's a very, very high priority, homelessness and, uh, you know, really putting an emphasis on economic development because that's how we're going to be able to get some of the revenue to pay for some of the services. So I just want to say thank you to, to the staff and everyone who, who works to make San Jose better, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Those are some really good points. I appreciate you acknowledging that some of the things we've funded on a one-time basis will unfortunately and inevitably be uh, likely going away or at least scoped down a bit as we have just simply fewer resources coming in the door as that one-time fiscal stimulus funding is spent. I also think your point that we have to be realistic about capacity and have that clarity is really important. We've historically had some priority, so-called priority setting sessions where we talked about 40 or 50 priorities, but then we're only able to actually make progress on 10 of them. So it's, it's important for us to be realistic about our, our true capacity. We're going to go on to our, uh, we still have three hands up. We'll go to Councilmember Batra next. Mayor, I will <coughs> not try to repeat many of the items which are well covered in the prioritization which is already presented by the staff. I do agree with my colleagues. They have made eloquent points about reiterating the points which are what is our priority. I think our 98 services, they are a lot. We are a complex city. We are a large city. So the number of services we provide is really a reflection of the kind of city we have. Okay? So it is not we chose to have 98. I did not that we have to have a complexity, but we are inherited a complexity, so we have to deliver all those complexities. So we are given that task to do. And I appreciate that our city staff is doing with whatever resources they have, they're excelling in their services. What I like to stay with is the comments which have been made till now, they seem to be confusion between what is a priority and what is a prescriptive solution to that priority. I would stay away from being the prescriptive solution. I'll let the best people who know this stuff, which is the city staff, to come back with the solutions to the priorities which we are 
suggesting here to happen. So first of all, I'd like to say that we have one of the priorities uh, which you listed is homelessness. I'd like to change the name of that one to be homelessness and affordable housing because that would reflect more appropriately what you are trying to accomplish under the priority set under there because it is a lot more than just getting the unsheltered to be sheltered in that one in the homelessness. All the issues which are made, we're getting three more at this given time, they will get better addressed if we are calling it a homelessness and affordable housing. The comments which have been made about that, hey, we should get solve the problem this way or that way, I think our housing staff again knows better. So we have a shortage of the land or at least a land on which we are allowed to build any of the houses, okay? So we would like to, I would like to say that our goal there is to lower the cost. How much can we lower? Let the staff come back with that. It was a million dollar a door. You come back with whatever improvements can be made in whatever, whether it's in the policy area, whether in uh, implementation area, whether working with the state, come back with how much can you lower because I haven't seen a word from the housing to say what can they lower to. We all keep saying, hey, million dollars is too much. And we say lower it, but we don't know what it should be or what we should expect. So I would like to make that as a priority that we need to lower the cost per door. We need to be able to find certain percentage of the acceptable land on which we can build and let the staff come back with how we get that done. Okay. Under the cleaning neighborhoods uh, transitional thing, we in every one of these section, there's a recommendation being made, focus on hiring. That's again a, a prescriptive kind of a thing. City staff knows that they need to hire people. I don't think we need to be spending too much time in trying to reiterate that one. In order to provide those services, they will find a way to do it. If they need our help, we'll be more than happy to give it to them. I don't want to continue emphasizing, hire more, hire more, hire more. <laughs> okay. They know they have to do it. Okay. And the other comment which was often made here is, let's increase the funding for this thing, increase the funding for that. Hey, money is necessary, but it is not always sufficient for the solution we are trying to get. So let's get the solution in, and proposed, and then let that solution dictate how much money is needed. Money isn't the first answer for a lot of these problems, okay? So as a result, I would suggest that let's focus on the solutions which staff can bring it to our priorities, and then worry about how much money they are asking or what they will need, and then we can choose between the alternative they give us other than coming back and saying increase the funding for this, increase the funding. Increase the programs which you want and let, let's get to that, okay? So I, I will leave it at that one and I'll wait for the staff to come back with the right proposals and we'll comment on that one if we got the priorities right or if we need to shift some trade-offs. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cohen? I, I think Councilmember Foley, since I've already gone, I'll, she should. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Foley, correct. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. I've <laughs> been sitting here patiently waiting for my turn. So this is my fifth priority setting session, which makes me one of the veterans. Isn't that surprising? But, and it's the third variation of it. Each one has its own... Um, dynamics of what works and what and what doesn't work so this is new for all of us the question i have and and, and actually this is this is actually a question for you mayor the whole point of this process is to help form your budget message which is your right to prepare as per the charter the charter conveys that upon you the ability to create the budget message is it your intent then to take all of the information today and then craft your budget message? Yes, that's exactly the process both 
through the transition committees where I wanted to highlight five areas and run a transition process to get feedback in those five areas. And then this is meant to be an opportunity to go beyond that and hear feedback from folks on the entirety of our CSAs. So everything today is feedback that's being collected. And that message, of course, supersedes anything we do today. That's the action that we'll take collectively. There's no direction we're giving today on the budget, just to be clear. That was going to be my follow-up question. So if there are other items that we haven't mentioned today publicly, and, and if you look at the CSAs, and yeah, I've listened to all the staff presentations, pretty much everything that the community has talked about is priorities, wage theft, responsible contractors, hiring more staff, all those things, they're already included in the CSAs as I read them. And then there's the five transition teams of, of the homeless. Uh, homeless one is the one that I participated in. So your intent is to take all the information. This is an information gathering opportunity for you. And, we're, and what we're passing is approving the staff recommendation and the two council members' uh, memos but it doesn't preclude you from adding anything else that you may want to include or that we may want to include if we're in your Brown Act. Correct, and just to be clear, when we come back in March, which is still high level direction, I know there are a lot of new folks here. The, the message, the, the budget is not confirmed until June by a majority vote of this body. Folks are welcome to bring forward memos in March and it, uh, related to the March budget message. So that would be the time to you know, make the case for adding something that you see missing. Don't worry, the March budget message is going, to, is going to speak to vacancies. It's going to touch on the CSAs. I also have a focus on five strategic areas that you all are very well aware of. We talked about those in the last session. So all of this, I think, will be reflected in the March budget message, and then we'll discuss if folks want to recommend modifications to that message at that time. So I'm okay with us moving the, the, the current motion includes the memos, which is fine as long as we're clear that that's in the spirit of feedback, that's not budget direction. There is a difference there. You, we would be, as I understand the motion on the floor, accepting the staff report, incorporating these two memos as the written feedback of two of our council members, but not dictating, the budget message comes forward in two weeks. So should, clear. Uh, thank you for that. So to make sure that we're not violating the charter, should we add the word feedback in the motion somewhere? I think it should be clear or, or, that this is, these are, this is feedback. Two, two council members happen to have written it out very clearly right. in their memos. Right. I've been taking copious notes, right. as has my team, on the verbal feedback from everybody else. So as long as it's in the spirit of these are all inputs and feedback, council member, you made the motion. So yeah, yeah. I just want to say I'm, I'm perfectly fine with making sure that this is feedback. I definitely did not want to confine all the uh, information in this meeting just to my memo or uh, the council member's memo. I just wanted to make sure it was on the record. And I tried to think of three items that I think we all agree on. And so I definitely have more stuff to talk about, which I'll wait till March to, to do so. Yeah, thank you. thank you for that, Council Member. And I don't disagree with either of the memos or the motion on the table. I'm just trying to get clarification. The other thing I want to bring to the public's attention and uh, remind my colleagues who haven't been through this budget process before is that prior years, the budget, the mayor didn't come to us and say, what are your priorities? Prior years, the mayor would only be talking to the people in his Brown Act, which is he will still have that flexibility, but we never had this opportunity to make public comments to him about the budget. We waited for the budget, we got the budget, and then as we went through the several budget process meetings, we were able to make public comments. So this is kind of preloading some information that I think is really, really helpful, and we, it's, it's our jobs to keep an eye on the things that are most important to us. And, and so many colleagues have called out Vision Zero, so I will not uh, call out Vision Zero as the chair of that task force. That's a real priority and, and for um, many, many reasons, but uh, 12 million is just a drop in the bucket, but we need to make sure we allocate it properly. Um, and all the other things that have been talked about by the public, filling vacancies, the police reforms. Uh, someone mentioned that we all were rated uh, Fs as it relates to police reforms, and you're right, not all of us. Former, the current, the, the veteran council members, the new council members don't have a grade yet. And, and I do own that. I do, do own that we haven't 
Um, we approve the reforms, but they're in the process. There's a lot of them, and they're being, they'll be implemented over time. I'm really confident about that. How quickly, hopefully, we can uh, get through those. I also wanted to ask about uh, essential services because that's a pot of money we haven't really talked about, but Councilmember Ortiz talked about the ability to, that in prior council members have had, or council years, we've been able to ask you for a certain pot of money or certain allocations. We're going to have that same process or some variation of that? Correct. And that, I believe, is Jim Shannon or Jennifer, if you want to comment, I think that'll be, there's an informational memo today, isn't there? Is it today that it's coming no, out? No, um, we're putting out the five-year forecast um, coming up here probably in the next day or so, uh, which will give us a, a good preview of what we're forecasting for next year fiscally and, and for our budget and the general fund specifically and for the next five years. As far as the essential services reserve, which I know you're responsible for, it, uh, it would be our intent, assume, assume, uh, assuming that the council approves that as part of the direction from the March budget message, to do that type of process again. It has okay. is, is proven to be a very good process in the many, many years I've been part of it. And that's our opportunity to request funding of certain priorities that might be in our district, maybe that's street improvements and parks, whatever, whatever we might need, and then you have that flexibility to say, good list, come back again or whatever your process is going to be. Right, and that's one time typically concrete investments in your in your district right. or, or one off investments. Right, yeah. understand. And uh, yeah, fully my intention to continue with that process we've had. Okay. But that that gets noted in the March budget message and then uh, is a process that plays out between then and June. Okay, great. I really I really appreciate it. I I want to thank staff for your presentation. It was uh, frankly a little Confused. Now, the presentation was great. Prior to the con presentation, I was a little confused about what the expectation was and how I was uh, supposed to be responding, but I really, uh, looking at the CSAs as you have, knowing that you've just highlighted five things in each CSA, there's so many more things that go on in each of those uh, CSA units that uh, couldn't be captured here. but. The work that our staff does is uh, truly a yeoman's effort, and they work extremely hard. And they've been sitting here not having lunch, and it's almost, what, 2 o'clock? And you've been sitting here since 11 o'clock. So I acknowledge your presence here, and hopefully we can get through this, and then you can go about your day and, and get some work done. I, I'm very mindful of overburdening staff, and we have the most capable, most professional <laughs> staff in the, in the area. I'd say in the country, but I don't, can't speak that big. I'm just so proud of all the work that you do, and I want to thank you. You have my, my total respect for everything that all of, all of you do for us. And with that, I conclude my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Cohn? Yeah, just, just to be quick. Uh, so the process will still be a budget document process that happens in, in the spring. Um, I've heard a couple times from various people this idea that we have to get back to basics, core services, and this idea that these four, five focus areas are those basics. I want to make it very clear, yes, our residents are saying we're concerned these, aren't being, these areas aren't being addressed or they need improvement, but I don't doubt that our residents believe that their library is being open, that their parks being available to them. By the way, Island Rock Park's been closed since the rainstorms, and what we hear from people is the frustration of not be having that available. We have staff in our city that are trying to get that park back open and running. It's really important that we still offer that for our residents. Um, our disaster preparation, we saw in, this, in January how important it is that we have staff who are out on the streets cleaning backed up sewers, dealing with trees that have fallen, keeping our neighborhoods safe. We have to have a resilience plan for the inevitable floods and things that are happening due to climate change. We would be, it would be terrible for us not to do that going forward. Those are important services as well. And if they, those things aren't there, that's when people will say we have a problem. The good news is we have a great staff and those things are there, and so they're not complaining. The fact is, during this most recent storm, we actually did a really good job of getting our staff mobilized and out there on the streets. So I just want to be clear, when we talk about getting back to the basics and core services, those are the core services that fortunately we do well as a city. But the minute the libraries are not open, when, we, when the people expect them to be open, that's when we're going to start to hear that we're not doing our job. Road maintenance, street lights, 
all the things that we do as a city. And so I, I, I don't think anybody intends this, but I just want to be clear. We, it's been frustrating to me to hear this idea about going back to basics. And so I, I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot, but I want to make sure that that's understood. Um, and then on the homelessness, just to follow up just on a couple comments that um, Councilmember uh, Duan made about homelessness, our committee on homelessness did talk about prevention of homelessness, which is an important part of it. The good news is that all the work that, that we've been doing over the years has brought that number down. Instead of three for every one, I think we're down at 1.6 or so for every one. We have to get down so we're at one to one or less in order to prevent the number from continuing to grow. That's why we did recommend, and I think it's in the list of recommendations, to, to fund homelessness prevention uh, through various organizations, but also to try to put in place tenant protections, right to counsel. Those things are in the recommendations that will help people prevent evictions so that they will uh, end up um, hopefully not becoming homeless. So I just want to make it clear, this is an all. This has has a multifaceted approach to homelessness. Thanks. Thanks, Councilmember, and I, I don't disagree at all. I think there's a huge difference between a core or a central service that everyone relies on us for that must happen, starting with treating our wastewater. If you want to see civilization disappear quickly, stop uh, doing that consistently. And a few focus areas where I think we can, uh, I think most of us would agree we need transformation and we need to approach what we're doing very differently and be more experimental and try to innovate more. So I, I don't think there's any conflict between those concepts, even if um, some of the verbiage we've been using may be confusing folks. So I think we have completed, we've gotten through all of the hands. I believe we are ready to vote. Why don't we do that? Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kamei? Aye. Mahan? Aye. And just thank before you. we close, I want to really thank city staff again, particularly the city manager and her senior team. You guys did a fantastic job with the memo, the presentation. Appreciate you all taking the time to be here. This is just the beginning of our budget conversations. We are going to bring our special meeting to a close. Tony, how quickly can we, you need 10. Okay, we will need to take a 10 minute recess. So we will be back at 2.13 for our regularly scheduled council meeting. Thank you all very much. We're adjourned. If Ravi Patak is in the audience, can Ravi please come down to see me? Thank you. <laughs>